Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plan Healing Center, the Temple, the Way of Light. Uh, the temple is a place I've worked at for about the past decade now, uh, so I can really attest to the quality of the work they do. They're a Shpibo plant medicine healing center working predominantly with ayahuasca. They run 12-day retreats, uh, working with six ceremonies, four different healers or curanderos, uh, two to three facilitators, which are kind of like the bridges. Um, there's a yoga teacher, a vegetalista or an herbalist, uh, massage people, and really just an amazing support staff, which is really conducive in creating a space that allows people to go really deeply into this work and to gain the, the things they're coming to look for, whether that's uh, learning, insight, knowledge, healing, uh, connection, whatever that may be. So it's a really amazing place. Um, and if you're interested to work with Iowa, to learn more about um, indigenous cultures and healing modalities and experience that firsthand, the temple is a, a really amazing place. So to find out more information about that, you can visit their website at templethewayoflight.org. Uh, they've been closed since uh, March of 2020 due to the pandemic, but hopefully they'll be opening in June of this year. Um, also, this podcast is being sponsored by Ecstatic Dance Online, which is an online transformational dance experience brought to you through the magic of Zoom. Uh, it was founded by my friend Rafael and his partner, Elena Pashnova. Um, and in one hour and 45 minutes, you will receive a short but potent open, opening ceremony, followed by an hour of ecstasy-inducing, expertly crafted DJ sets, finishing with a closing integration and friendly open space for community and sharing. Uh, each week, the dance ceremony takes on new and interesting themes, and they bring in a variety of guest DJs from around the world, uh, and you'll get a chance to hear all different genres of music in an exciting tempo to stoke your inner alchemical fire. Um, Raphael's a good friend of mine. He's an ecstatic dance DJ from Canada who's also a dancer himself, and he focuses on the importance of the inner work on processing emotions and feelings and guides in the healing process with his music. And he says his motto is dancing light and bright to reveal the dark and secret. And his partner Elena is a passionate dancer and a true nomad. She brings her vast ecstatic dance experience, love of life, and skills as a certified dance movement therapist to the opening and closing setting. And her motto is let me dance in the sun wearing wildflowers in my hair. Uh, I had a chance to participate a little bit in their last session and uh, I think they do really uh, good and beautiful work. So if you're interested in dancing, ecstatic dance, uh, give them a shout and I'll put a link up in the show notes to contact them. Um, and then finally, myself and my colleague Marav Artsy, who I interviewed, uh, I believe episode 28, are continuing to run dietas here in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Uh, uh, the last one went really well that we ran in March, uh, and we're doing another one in May and a following one in September. So it's a really beautiful way, if you're interested in working with plants and going deeper into this process through a process of isolation, kind of deprivation, and uh, beginning to work with one specific plant to really experience the, the, the learning, the teaching, the healing benefits of that, uh, being guided by myself and her um, through the tradition we were trained in, working with uh, tobacco and trees, uh, it's a really beautiful opportunity. So um, if you'd like to learn more about that, you can listen to my interview with her, also my interview on dietas and also tobacco, and you can reach out to us through my website at nicotianarustica.org and through Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. This episode of the show, I spoke with uh, Joey Greenstone, and he was, um, I had known about him through mutual friends that we have. Um, and my friends Suzanne and Lacey recently worked with him and, and really spoke very highly of him and recommended that I reach out and talk to him. So uh, it's been a few months in the making. Uh, we've been a bit busy, but our our schedules finally got a chance to meet up, and it was really a pleasure. He does a lot of work with um, Wachuma, which is a, a plant cactus, uh, considered a, a master plant, a, a teacher plant here in the Andes of Peru. 
a really long history of, of people working uh, with that. It, it seems it goes um, very far back to the times of a culture named uh, Chavin, Chavin de Huantar, which uh, predates the Incas by, by quite a long time. So um, we got into some really interesting topics, his background, his, his work with that plant, uh, his experiences working with ayahuasca, kind of what it is uh, to, 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 to hold that space, to be a healer, what is shamanism, um, and then getting into some of the aspects of Wachuma, what it is, how it's worked with, and uh, just a really uh, a variety of topics. So it was a pleasure to talk to him. He's, he's a really good guy. Uh, he's got a big heart, and, and I think his uh, intentions are really good, and from what I've heard, he, he holds a beautiful space. So uh, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, that's a really big help. Um, so that I can continue to bring on these guests like Joey. Patreon is a really good option. Uh, it's a subscription service uh, through donating as little as a dollar a month uh, and, and different tiers you can sign up for. You get some really beautiful things back. So it's kind of this Andean concept of I need to, to give and to receive. Um, so uh, getting things like early access to shows, Q&As, bonus materials. Uh, so that's a really big help to support me and to support this podcast. So all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. There's also the option of direct donating via PayPal. There'll be a link to both of those in the show notes. And if you're not able to do that, simply going on the YouTube channel, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help with the algorithms. And with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, also subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. So if you're able to do that, thank you very much. So I think that's it. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Joey. like we're looks like we're rolling and everything's set up all right great <laughs> so uh yeah we we had mentioned what we were talking your your friends with uh suzanna also claude's some of the some of my friends as well yep you were also mentioning you had lived in Iquito. so maybe just to start uh maybe just a bit about your background you, you said you're from philly and maybe yeah. some of the younger years and what eventually brought you to, to this side of the world absolutely all right, so yeah, I am from uh, the Philadelphia area in Pennsylvania. I was born and raised there, and I lived there uh, most of my life prior to coming to Peru, with the exception of four years of uh, going to college in Ithaca, New York. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, and it was during uh, junior year of college, I guess, that I went to Mexico on spring break, of all things, <laughs> <laughs> to Cancun, and, uh, you know, we were going down to do the, the spring break thing, the party thing. And I actually had a, 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 my first spiritual awakening on spring break in Cancun when I was about 20 years old. Mm. So, yeah, that was kind of um, unexpected because I had been pulling to go to Jamaica because I had recently gotten uh, scuba dive certified and I had it in my mind that um, Jamaica was in the Caribbean, so it must have better scuba diving. And I got overruled by my other three friends, and they're like, we're going to Cancun. <laughs> and then I started to do a little research on the scuba diving there, and it turns out that that's like uh, part of the second biggest barrier reef in the world and all that stuff. So I was like, all right, great, I get to scuba dive. But when I got there, um, I started to experience for the first time um, altered states of consciousness just spontaneously happening. So something within me was connecting with the you know, with the spirit and the energy of that land, which is uh, part of the ancient Mayan lands. And that's when my life changed very drastically. Um, and it was my first awakening, as I said. And after that, I went back home and just began to devour books on uh, spiritual topics, new age section at the bookstore, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how, but, would you, how would you describe what was happening in Cancun? <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I just felt like I was connected with something and, and that there was a familiarity. Mm -hmm. um, now we could probably say that it was past life uh, recall or remembering mm -hmm. being there before in a, mm -hmm. different, <laughs> in a different body. 
so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some some sense of like connection or remembering. Yeah, connection or remembrance, or and this is like this incredible like um, excitement and the sense of like meaning, like that there was something more in life, mm-hmm. something higher and bigger than anything I'd ever experienced before, anything that I was ever taught or kind of forced upon me with religion and things like that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And there was an excitement, and so even though it was like in this body in this lifetime. I hadn't experienced it. I kind of knew it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's a really good uh, sales pitch for Cancun Spring Break. <laughs> yeah, go, to sp- <laughs> go to Spring Break and you'll wake up spiritually. No, I don't necessarily recommend I do recommend the place, but maybe don't go on Spring Break. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and then going back, I just, like as I was saying, I was just devouring books on, on these spiritual topics because I felt like at that point that something was calling me. Like I was mm-hmm. like, there's something. There's something I need to discover or something that I need to figure out. And so reading all the books, you know, from topics like uh, Eastern philosophy, definitely a focus on ancient culture, but also like um, high consciousness, so how the ancient cultures may have had some sort of high consciousness that was uh, lost um, in time Mm -hmm. and uh, shamanism and things like that. And then eventually it led me to discovering plant medicine um, and getting a call from ayahuasca. And I had another similar experience to the Cancun experience maybe um, five years after uh, the, the Mexico experience. And that's when I feel like I really received the call from ayahuasca uh, to go down to the Amazon and to start an apprenticeship. In my mind at that time, I, was, I, I knew that there was no doubt. Like, this is, oh, this is finally, this is my life calling. I'm going to go do this. And what was that calling like? Because that, that seems to be a fairly common experience for people who somehow end up on yeah. this path, whatever we want to call that. But. Right. Well, again, um, I had a... Had a an experience over the course of a week or so in a place um, on a beach by myself where, again, I was kind of slipping in and out of these altered states. And I felt like more past life recall stuff was coming up. And I just felt I couldn't confirm it until I first took the medicine. But what I can say now is, is that I was starting to feel the connection with the plant spirits and specifically at that time, ayahuasca. Um, so like after taking the medicine, I can look back on those experiences. Oh, okay. That's how the medicine was communicating with me. And it's kind of like you feel it in, um, just kind of the way that the, the spirits speak to you through the visions and then the feelings in your body. So you can see things, but you can also feel things. Um, when it was happening initially, I didn't know, uh, fully that it was ayahuasca at first. And then, mm-hmm. you know, over the course of the experience, um, was it something like when you then when you kind of found out about ayahuasca, something yeah. clicked and you're like, oh, that's, that's exactly that's it. it. Uh, yeah. So it was like, well, actually, I just kind of stumbled across a book and then I was reading it. I was like, oh, this is what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that book at the time was uh, The Cosmic Serpent, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which was uh, a really good read then. Yeah. Yeah. And so I knew. So I just made preparations over the course of a year. <clears throat> um to come down to Peru for the first time. And it's interesting because after <clears throat> after the first experience in Mexico, which I call like the first uh, awakening that I had, it didn't quite all happen in one go. It was like there was a few awakenings um, that were major in my life, but that was the first one. But at that time, I was like, I want to move to Mexico. That's all I could talk about, all I could think about. Uh, was moving to Mexico, but it always became something like next year I'm moving to Mexico or I'm going to move to Mexico next year. And just, it never happened. Um, you know, it's life. And there was a lot of things going on in my life, a lot of challenges and trials at that time, looking back in my life with my family. Um, but after I got the call from ayahuasca, um, something happened, um, within, um, a week of returning back from that experience. Um, I spent the day with my younger brother and this is really a a powerful story 
probably won't share the whole thing, but um, I spent the last day that I would ever spend with my younger brother. And I was just coming off of this experience where I was feeling charged. I felt like I was awakening even more. And um, we went back and visited uh, the childhood home that we, we grew up in and went out into the woods where we used to play as, as kids. And there was an, a, a space, um, a little grove of trees in the woods where I used to go a lot by myself. And now I, I was going back as an adult, a young adult. And uh, we just did a little ritual there um, where I spontaneously, I was just getting the guidance and I just kind of prayed for like the familial demons to be healed. And, and, and especially for my brother who was struggling with, uh, with uh, substance addiction and depression. And um, I prayed that, that there would be healing there and we held hands and he left, I asked him to leave a little offering of chewing tobacco because he was, he was chewing tobacco at that time. And it turned out to be um, the last day that I would ever spend with my brother, and he passed away um, six months later. Mm-hmm. And after that, it seemed like the last energetic connection or tie that was keeping me in the United, the United States was finally cut. And um, yeah, so within uh, within a few months after his passing, I was in the Amazon, uh, outside of Iquitos, taking ayahuasca for the first time. Mm-hmm. And what um what what brought you to Iquitos? It was that calling of of working with ayahuasca. Yeah, so I guess at that time, which was uh, in two thousand eight, uh, I just started to do some web searches, and um, I think it was through social media that I was connected with someone with mm-hmm. a, a woman who uh, had built a small retreat center, which is no longer no longer running, but. Uh, uh, we, she said, yeah, come down. I said, Hey, I was thinking about maybe, uh, getting certified to teach English so I can come down. She said, well, you can come down and start an apprenticeship and we want to give back to the community. So maybe you can teach English to the, to the students or to the students or the children in the, in the town. So that's what I did. That was kind of like the initial get me down, um, Mm. to Peru. And it was a kind of a tumultuous time because like after my brother passed, it didn't fully kick in, um, Maybe a few months after that, I kind of went off the deep end. I already knew I was going to Peru, but it really kicked in, and I kind of went off the deep end and was going on, like, drinking benders and stuff like that because I was just, like, so deeply sad. And Mm -hmm. someone coined the phrase to me, oh, you're going through survivor guilt. Mm -hmm. But it was something that I had experienced because I felt like, oh, if I would only just Mm -hmm. got my shit together sooner and went down to Peru and learned how to become a healer, maybe I could have you know, saved my brother kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, which it turns out didn't need to be the case, but that's what I was experiencing. Yeah. Um, but something else I can mention, which is, which is, uh, part of that story that continues my brother is, so I, I came down to Peru and, uh, I did an apprenticeship, uh, in the jungle with ayahuasca for several months. Um, I was naive because I thought I was going to be able to stay at the time. I had like sold my car in the States and like sold a lot of stuff and came down. Um, but I wasn't able to, to, to stay. So I had to go back to the States and I went back to the States for about a year. Like fi- financially you weren't able to. Yeah. I just couldn't make it work. It's just like, I couldn't find work. I was out of money. I was in a yeah. new place that I didn't really know. And <laughs> it kind of spit me back out. So I went back to the States and I ended up living out West uh, with family in Arizona for about a year. And uh, I started working and I started working my tail off. And all I could think about was to, uh, to get back to Peru. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I kind of went through a period for, for a few months of like a depression. It was like a post ayahuasca medicine Peru come down, which a lot of people experience. I, I've learned over the years when they go back to the States. But anyways, um, I ended up saving up money and working for that year to go back and work with the same group. And um, this time when I went down, it was it was unparalleled. The, the things that I experienced with the medicine um, was just, it was like a whole new level or league than from the previous time. And so I had an experience. I ended up leaving that, that retreat center and I was really just kind of being pulled along. I had a very powerful ceremony where um, it was really powerful and it was really difficult um, because I could see and feel like my mother weeping over 
my brother's casket. And I remember thinking to myself, like, oh, my God, I thought I went through and healed this last time. (laughs) And Ayahuasca had said to me, like, well, are you sure that that's your grief that you're feeling right now? And so I kind of felt and checked in with it. And I was like, oh, wow, no, it's, it's, it's not. And she said, well, you don't have to take that on if you don't want to. If that's your mother's grief, that's her. That's her thing. You know, you're feeling um, like shamanic empathy, so to speak. And so I was like, okay, that's interesting. And um, at, in that ceremony, Ayahuasca said to me, like, okay, now I want you to stay. You need to stay here. I don't know if she said I want you to stay. You need to stay in Peru. Because I was only planning to stay for three months and then go back to the States again and work uh, a job and save up money and then maybe move, like make the plunge. She said, no. I said, Ayahuasca, I'm out of money. <laughs> I, need, I need to go back and work this job. I already agreed to work this job. She said, it doesn't matter. Just stay and trust that the universe will provide everything that you need to survive and stay on the path. And you'll understand why later. And so, you know, as the journey of the ayahuasca ceremony continued, I began to get glimpses of what would come. Obviously, I didn't see everything in between, or I never would have stayed. (laughs) But um, I said, okay, I I know, I will. And so I ended up thinking about it for, for a couple weeks, and I ended up skipping my flight back to the States. So fast forward, almost 12 years later, here I am. I never left. Wow. But to kind of conclude this this story about my brother is I ended up leaving that retreat center and uh, I hooked up with a guy who I'd become friends with. He was a guide and he ended up taking me out to a more remote community um, a number of hours <clears throat> outside of Iquitos. And he's like, I want you to, uh, to meet this shaman guy. He's not an ayahuascaro, but he, he knows a lot about plants and stuff, so I'm going to take you to meet him. So we go meet this guy and he says... To us, he's like, you know, when I woke up this morning, I was just smiling. I knew like somebody or something was coming. And so, and he said, now you two are here. So um, he's like, all right, we're going to do a ceremony tonight. <clears throat> and um, this guy, he was what they call a palero um, or tree shaman. But he also had a, a medicine that was a purga, um, a purgative medicine made from ajo sacha tobacco and perfume. So he's like, all right, we're going to do this ceremony tonight. So took the medicine. It was like, and now I'm coming off of months of doing um, uh, shamanic plant diets and ayahuasca. So I was really in that space <laughs> more often than not. Um, and I took the medicine and within seconds I was in the medicine space. But it was so intense that it was like, the, it was like the veil between um, our, the 3D reality that we perceive and then the spirit world that's like right there. It was just like immediately ripped off. There was no like, you know, come on of the medicine and then vision starting to come on. It was just like instantaneous. <laughs> and uh, so he said to me, okay, go, go swim in the river and then come back. So I went and swam in the river and that was an adventure in and of, it, of itself. And I come back and he says, all right, so she says, there's some energy that I need to suck out of you. So I said, okay. And he's like, just sit forward and lean forward. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, he goes, all right, there's some here, here, and here. And so it was mostly in my back, kind of concentrated around the kidney area and along the spine. And so I'm leaning forward, <clears throat> you know, still in the medicine space. And I could see this like, this like glass orb in my vision. And it was, like, filled with this, like, viscous, almost, like, dark purple, oily stuff. And each time that the shaman came up and did the... And spit it out, it went down a notch. And then he did that about four times. And after the fourth time, the, the glass ball was empty. And then I just felt, like, this misty white light and energy just, like, come over me. And so he says, go, go sit over there and, and relax for a minute. So I did. And he comes over and he goes, you have a brother. And I'm like, yes, I do. Um, he died. Um, he died two years ago or a year ago, whatever it was at the time. And he goes, that was from him. And then in that instance, I remembered the day in the woods with my brother, the last day in the little ceremony that we did. And then the, the medicine began to... Uh, to teach me what happened and how I actually took on a lot of his stuff that day so that he could cross over and 
and be free of that. And then it, it played out on my body, but then I was able to clear it out with the plant medicine. So that was the very beginning of my uh, apprenticeship and, and experience with plant medicines. And did you end up staying with him for a while? Or? I, I did for a while. I ended up moving on. But unfortunately, one of the things that kind of got in the way is that yeah, this individual had a, had a drinking problem. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of common in the jungle, even amongst medicine practitioners. So it's just, I kind of like distanced myself from that. But he helped me out majorly at that time. And I'm forever grateful for that. And uh, Do you have a sense of why that is? Because as you said, it seems to be a, a fairly common thing, um, yeah. especially with alcohol. I mean, yeah. that seems to be a, a, like a, a thing that, that many people turn to. Yeah. Um, I mean, without mentioning names, I mean, even <clears throat> when when I moved down, the the person who was considered kind of the strongest Shipibo shaman was also a drunkard in a way. Yeah. You know, it's like when, when he came to ceremony, maybe he would sing, maybe he wouldn't. Right. <laughs> Depended on how much he had to drink. Right. So if he drank a lot, there was no ceremony. If he didn't drink so much, it was an incredible ceremony. Right. You have any sense of, of why that is? Yeah, I have some beliefs on it. And one of the things, too, that <clears throat> um, I think it's really important to notice that, at least as it is now, um, the tradition of, of plant medicine, as it's come up um, until like like today, like now in time, um, it didn't necessarily have an emphasis or, or a focus on consciousness development. So like what you would see in the East with these like guru traditions, especially like in India and the Far East, um, uh, there was a component, a component to the, the spirituality that's focused on consciousness development or spiritual evolution. Whereas in the jungle and the Amazon, not so much. It's like you can be a very accomplished plant shaman, but ultimately it can be nothing more than just being a, a doctor that works with spirits. It doesn't mean that these individuals are sages or that they've actually done any kind of consciousness development work on themselves over the years. So there's kind of a dichotomy there. And these two paths don't have to be mutually exclusive, like the consciousness path and the plant medicine path, but they often are. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it seems to be amongst many native practitioners, practitioners that there's just no focus of that. And I'm sure there's a large component of that that has to do with the conquest of the Americas and um, just the state that these indigenous peoples were left after Spain conquered and had their, their colony and then it was eventually kicked out. And um, so I think that may be part of it. And, you know, compared to Western standards, um, the places and the villages that these people are coming from, be it... Um, purely indigenous communities or even the mestizo communities, um, it's very poor. Um, and um, I guess without that, that uh, set of standards that is consciousness development, I think it's very easy for people to just kind of get manipulated by their egos. And, um, you know, trauma, trauma leads to substance addiction, you know, and, and so... You know, if people are, are becoming maestro levels, but not really fully taking the time to heal all of their traumas. And then I think that's how you have that, well, this guy's really powerful, but yet at the same time, he's, he's kind of a train wreck with his, uh, his drinking. Do you think some of that is kind of even the practice of, even as you said for yourself, like knowingly or, or unknowingly taking on things? through that work and then somehow alcohol becomes uh, maybe a way to assuage that or to escape that and yeah. it becomes a, a, at least a temporary relief in, in some manner. Absolutely. I mean, f the relationship that I've had with alcohol in my life, like at first it was just like this new experience and it was a lot of fun. So, you know, you're like going to college. So then we would like uh, do it because it was new and we would do it because it was fun. And then it got to a point where, um, we had to do it. I had to drink to have fun. And then it got to a point where it wasn't fun anymore. And it was just something I had to do because I was band-aiding um, all the pain that I was feeling in my life. And I had a very difficult uh, family life. 
Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, it was like self-medication, but, but the Band-Aid effect, and ultimately then it ends up doing much more harm than good, um, mm-hmm. alcohol, and it's something that's really hard to stop. Um, but, uh, fortunately, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like patting myself on the back, but I, <laughs> I, I decided to really take on the work in earnest and mm-hmm. to get to the root all, of all of this stuff. Um, I was shown things in some of my early, uh, ayahuasca experiences, like you're gonna, if you take this on, you're going to heal everything. Like you're going to get to that complete healed state in this lifetime. It's not going to be easy, but you can do it. And so that was kind of like the, I don't know, um, not a measuring stick, but something that was guiding me on. Um, I've had a number of teachers over the years. I didn't just apprentice with one person um, and then get taken to like my extra level with plant medicine. I ended up jumping around and I actually, a number of my teachers were, were not good. <laughs> they were not good uh teachers but in the same at the same time in the same sense they were some of the best teachers because they showed me what not to do um not that i ever had an inclination to turn to the dark side or to you know misbehave or be out of line or whatever but i guess i just had the faculties to be able to observe and like discern like oh this is what happens when um you know you're not fully in alignment and you're not following the straight and narrow when it comes to uh, plant medicine practice so I can't really say they were bad teachers. Like they necessarily were not in great integrity or they were not good people maybe, but uh, they ended up being good teachers because they were bad as they show, they taught in contrary. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm really grateful for those experiences because I saw quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, that seems like a, like an, an important distinction because, you know, as you said, they're, I mean, much like we would think of a, a Western medical doctor, um, they're not necessarily, if very rarely probably, you know, someone who maybe truly embodies, uh, you know, wisdom or mm-hmm. a, a wholeness. They can be a very good doctor and yet obviously still have all of their faults as a human being. Right. And But we don't tend to, to judge them in that capacity. We, we simply judge them on, like, are they a good doctor? We, we very rarely look at like their their personal life or their their life outside of that. Right. Often because we don't know. I mean, there, right. there's a disconnect. That's true too. <laughs> um, but it, it seems interesting because often, kind of in this world with with, with shamans or healers, curanderos, there, it, it seems like we approach it in a different light. Mm. We we look much more at the person and judge them in a different way than we would a, a like a Western medical doctor. Right. Yeah, I think, and the reason for that is for what, I think there's like this like subconscious belief about the practitioners here because of what people know of like the Far East and people going on like spiritual pilgrimages and then, you know, like trying to find these enlightened masters in India and so forth. Um, And then they just kind of transpose that onto um, plant medicine Shamans, the people who are, you know, um, conducting down here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so like I said, people kind of get stars in their eyes. They come down and they kind of put um, these human beings up on pedestals as if they were enlightened masters. And that can lead to a lot of issues, too, a lot of problems. Um, you mentioned this idea that, the, you know, some of some of that may have been lost in, in conquest. But... Like even even the Shipibo who who I've done a lot of work with, uh, they their their word for ayahuasca, which which they use a lot, mm-hmm. is uni, and it's often translated as this idea of of, of like knowledge. Yeah. But I think much more in the sense of of even in in the the foundation of a lot of what we would consider to be like Western philosophy that that mm-hmm. started with with Greeks and, and probably even earlier with Egyptians, but but this Greek idea of of gnosis, yeah, and to me it really embodies more of that that quality because even from my understanding in, in the Greek language, there's two words for knowledge. There's gnosis. And then there's some other word for knowledge that nobody knows because <laughs> right. it's really not that important. But that's the knowledge that we seem to, in, in a lot of the cultures we come from, 
there seems to be much more of an emphasis on that kind of knowledge. Like you go to university and that's the knowledge you get in the university. Mm. It's like, this is this and that is that. Whereas I think that idea of gnosis is, it's also can be translated as knowledge, much like uni, but it's more of, of like a wisdom or an, an experience that's beyond mind. You know, the, mm. it, it's a knowledge that the mind is never going to be able to say, right. oh, this is this and this is this. <clears throat> but it's interesting because, you know, from, from what I understand in, in the Shpibo hierarchy, the uni being ayahuasca, one who works with ayahuasca is an unaya, but that's actually the the first level of what they would consider like a, a healer, a master. Mm. It's a very high level. I mean, to get there is a tremendous feat. You right. know? <laughs> of course. But then there's they, they would actually say there's two levels above that. There's the the yoba, which I think there's many ways of looking at that. I think that the most base, which they often would say, is is that's like the the brujo or the the the, the dark kind right. of side. My sense is that's been mistranslated or misunderstood over time. Mm. Um, but then there's there's a third level, which is called Moraya, and that's actually considered like the highest. And to me, it, it seems like, you know, from, from what I've heard and what I understand, that actually embodies more of maybe this Eastern idea of you're talking about of, of like someone who has had an experiential realization and, and they can operate in that level. And there's even stories of, of like someone who can transform into a jaguar or become mm-hmm. an eagle. And, you know, I, I don't think what they're really talking about in this physical sense, but it, it's in this sense of spirit or, you know, because in that world, even these ideas of like oneness, like the, that, that eagle can be us we, we can be a manifestation of that or that, that that power of the jaguar that ability to transcend like what we consider reality what we consider to be the human form mm. and being able to connect in these these other levels but it's interesting because they say there are no more moraya mm. and often the answer would be something like nobody wants to do that work anymore mm. You know, nobody wants to go out in the jungle and die at one tree for five years. Right. <laughs> There's too many other things that are too tempting, that are too... So do you do you have a sense of, you know, maybe like why that is? Potentially that, that certain people like doctors, they, they do stop at a certain level. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, again, in this mythology, like in, in antiquity, there were these people who maybe in Eastern terms, embody this Buddha nature or yeah. this, this, but it seems like that's not existing now. Yeah. And it's not to take away from, you know, the incredible work people are doing because it's, you know, as you were saying, it's, you know, it's phenomenal. I mean, like what you've experienced, that's, that's a deep healing, which is probably very few places in the world where that even exists anymore. Yeah. Without a doubt. I think it's a split um, in the collective psyche, but talking specifically about the Western mind. So we're coming from industrialized so-called Western countries that have distanced themselves greatly from their connection with, uh, with the earth and with spirit. And um, so you have like, you have like medical practice, like in antiquity as a complete practice, a holistic practice. And only half of it is focused on, or maybe even less than half, which is like the physical component that we see in allopathic medicine, which doesn't uh, treat the the human being as a as a spirit, um, as an eternal being, and as having um, subtle energetic bodies beyond the physical body. So, I always uh, talk about now, or. I don't always talk about it, but I talk about it, um, that like being the medicine, like it was told to me years ago, like be the medicine, you have to be the medicine. If you're the practitioner, you're the shaman, you're the master, you have to be it. Um, it's not something that you can just, uh, show up and practice, but then outside of ceremony, oh, you can do whatever. You can be a drunk as we were talking about earlier, you can just, uh, eat terrible foods and be out of shape and and unhealthy in that way and then show up and do, you know, the medicine and ceremony, it's not going to work. We understand that now if you have any um, 
connection to holistic practices, you understand and know that there's going to be a translation from from that those uh, those um, those behaviors, those unhealthy behaviors that are going to translate through your practice and to your the people that you are otherwise trying to help. Um, so, you know, unfortunately in the West, we don't come from that that background. Like you don't necessarily go to the doctor and go like, is this a person that I would want to emulate in my life? Do I want to receive healing from this person? Would I want to be that person? And maybe in some cases people would say yes. You know, it's prestigious positions. They make a lot of money. Um, they have degrees from uh, so-called prestigious uh, schools and, and things like that. But um, for me, at least, I've been now over the last decade plus um, endeavoring to be the medicine and uh, you know, trying to shape myself into the person that I would wholeheartedly follow um, if I was looking for a teacher, if I was looking for a healer, you know, it's like the, the, the phrase healer, heal thyself. So, you know, first and foremost for any, you know, real medicine person to be able to assist someone on all the levels of the being, you know, talking about the spiritual, uh, the emotional, the mental, the physical, all the subtle parts of the being of the human being up to the physical um, you have to first heal yourself there <laughs> and and be able to to know how that's done and to be able to hold the vibration of the healed state. Um, you know, maybe we never get there in the in this lifetime. Maybe there's always tiny little bits that we'll need to heal so long as we're alive in this human body. But for the most part, healing the core issues so that you can be the medicine mm-hmm. for others. So you don't see that in the Western world. And I think, unfortunately, in a lot of the cases of these practitioners that we were talking about, um, there's a disconnect there because they're not um, holding themselves to those standards in their, in their life outside of the ceremony space. Um, one of the things that was told to me early on, and I love this saying, is that it was so important for me to learn in the early days uh, with, with ayahuasca and with plant medicine and it and this person said to me, there's no such thing as outside of ceremony. Hmm. Once you take that first cup, that's it. You're always in ceremony now in every moment for the rest of your life. And so if you can kind of like rise up to that challenge and to that knowing, you'll see that, yeah, you, this whole life is a ceremony. You're constantly in the ceremony. The universe is going to bring you lessons. And when you, when you get them and you transcend them, then more will come. You can't separate the ceremony space from your personal life and from what's going on in the world. It's all ceremony. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then you, you, you were working with this Valerdo, someone who works with trees. And then where, where did your journey kind of move on from there? So I was... Uh, Still working with ayahuasca. At that time, for me, I believed that I was going to become an ayahuasquero. That was what I believed my calling was still, and because um, I received that initial call from ayahuasca. And so I uh, tried to make that happen. Um, there was a person that was new in the country, and you know, I left my world behind. I really kind of burnt the bridge in a sense. I didn't ask for any help or assistance from uh from family or, or friends back home. I was just kind of doing my, old th- my own thing and letting spirit pull me along, um, as Ayahuasca said. And yeah, you know, in the early days, it was tough. I mean, there was, there was uh, you know, nights and periods of time where I had nowhere to stay, but an angel would always appear and something would work out. So I had a number of volunteer opportunities and I was trying to find my teacher. I was always trying to find my teacher and where can I like, you know, have this apprenticeship and still, um, you know, put a roof over my head and have food and stuff. Eventually, it, it led me to the mountains. Um, I don't know how else to, to describe my story without talking about the dark side of uh, plant medicine, plant spirit medicine, so I should probably mention it, but I got really messed up pretty badly by one of my first teachers um, with Black Magic. And um, that kind of expelled me from the jungle, and I ended up in the mountains. And uh, as I was recovering from from that ordeal, 
that's when I began to receive the call from Wachuma, the cactus medicine, through my dreams. So I began to take the medicine on my own because I knew I had this feeling inside that that, that was going to uh, assist me. And I was able to overcome the hardships. That's like, I could probably write a book about all of that stuff. But uh, yeah, that's how my path with, uh, with the Wachuma medicine and, uh, and living in the mountains began. Uh, it was kind of like getting chewed up and spit out of the jungle. Um, and yeah, so I should probably mention this. I, I had an experience um, after I was getting better um, and recovering from uh, the black magic or the witchcraft that was done to me. Um, I was living in a, in a mountain lodge uh, in, in the Andes, but up above Huaraz, which is uh, about six or seven hours north of Lima. So I wasn't yet uh, living in the Cusco area. And uh, um, it was interesting because uh, I was living in a little bungalow and um, I found a hummingbird. There was just a dead hummingbird right outside of like the window of my, of my bungalow because it was this big glass window. So I imagine maybe it <laughs> kind of dive bombed and, and that was it. So it was like really powerful. So like I, I had the hummingbird I managed to take some of its tail feathers and then I gave it a little funeral in the, in the compost heap. But uh, within a couple of days, I was invited to go to Chavin. Uh, so, you know, for those out there who don't know what Chavin is, it's a very ancient uh, ceremonial site and also the same name of a culture that was uh, many, probably many thousands of years before the Inca, at the time of the conquest. And the, <clears throat> um, so yeah, was invited to Chavin, went and did ceremony at a very powerful day. And that was when one of the times when I really and uh, first powerfully connected with the Wachuma medicine was there at the Chavin Temple, which is really an, initi- an initiation center. And it's like a place that's designed for um, working with the Wachuma medicine. Um, but I remember after that experience, um, I-, I went back to the mountain lodge and I was working there. And I had an experience in the middle of the night where um, I kind of woke up and I was seeing this, this, having a dream. I was like half asleep, half awake and seeing all these like Wachuma cacti, but they were all different colors. They weren't just green, which is the natural color. And I felt this like energy kind of come back in my chest and I was like, uh-oh, what's that all about? Oh, I hope this stuff isn't coming back. And Wachuma said, don't delay in taking my medicine again. We have a lot of work to do. So I was like, oh, okay. So I ended up um, getting some medicine again, it kind of like crossed my path and, uh, I came into possession of it and I went out on the mountainside by myself and I, I took the, the Wachuma medicine alone and I ended up dialoguing then with the spirit of Wachuma. And that was the moment, that was the experience when my path completely left the jungle world behind. Um, and when I was now on the Wachuma path and I asked, uh, Wachuma many questions and he really kind of explained to me and showed me why everything had happened in my life up until that point, why things had happened in the jungle. Um, and I remember saying, like, well, am I going to have a new human teacher or my astro or watch your teacher? And he said, no. He said, not at this point. Um, you're going to learn to learn directly from me. And then said, and therefore, the only ego that you're going to have to worry about is your own. I was like, okay, that's good after kind of having a string of not the best teachers in the world, which I already mentioned. And um, so I kind of like was able to see like what things from the shamanic path that I learned, um, you know, from Amazonian curanderismo and ayahuasca shamanism, you know, that would translate over to now Wachuma shamanism. And then you said the things that that don't apply, then you just kind of leave them aside. But the, but the core and the bulk of shamanic training is kind of the same and universal. So I brought that with me. And yeah, I remember what she was saying. So I'm going to be your teacher now, and this is going to be your medicine and your path if you choose to accept it. And I also remember him saying to me, and I will take you as far as any plant spirit can take you. And at some point in time, we may need to say goodbye. But for now... I'll be your teacher and your guide and uh, and the medicine that you're going to heal yourself with and share with the rest of the world. So that kind of speaks to me because I knew what he was saying then. When I say he, I'm referring to Wachuma, the spirit of this medicine, which 
uh, most people refer to as male, um, was that we're talking about consciousness development again. Like the plant can take you only so far um, on that path. And that's, I knew that that's what he was saying at that time. Wasn't talking about being a representative or an ambassador of the medicine for other people, but as far as like consciousness development in for the human being and in a lifetime, I think uh, even there there's a ceiling um, by using plant medicine, and it's pretty high, I would say. But so there was kind of no illusions about it. It's not like it's like you know someday we'll shake hands and say goodbye, but could be many, 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 many years later. <laughs> so. You mentioned this idea that, that Chauvin uh, is kind of this uh, initiation center. And I, I've heard that <clears throat> mentioned before. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I, I don't know the validity of this, but but I, I remember reading uh, about people who studied Chauvin that, as you said, you know, it was potentially many thousands of years before the Incan Empire. And they said that actually, and again, I'm not sure how they surmised this, but they were saying that they believed it was a time of great peace. And potentially because it was, the, these people were very embedded in, in this, this plant work, most likely with Wachuma. Um, and then you also mentioned this idea of the, these like shamanic tools that, that you realized you, you had gained in the jungle. So maybe you can talk a little bit about like what those tools are, what, what you know, shamanic tools are, and then also that process of, of initiation, because that, that seems to be a very common motif in, mm-hmm. in any shamanic path. Is yeah. It's often this idea of, of an initiation of, of some sorts. Right. Yeah, so with respect to initiation, I feel like it starts with the call. It's kind of, which is like an invitation um, to begin and uh, an apprenticeship, you know, which doesn't just apply to shamanism. There's like apprenticeships if you're going to become a master carpenter someday or or other trades. But similarly, you know, you have that call. Um, it seems to be that with shamanism, because it always has this air of mystery, even amongst tribes, um, going back hundreds of years or I don't know how many thousands of years, I'm going to separate that from these culture, these ancient cultures that were per- perhaps more advanced when we're talking about their levels of consciousness because um, there wasn't an um an unbroken lineage that we know of from those cultures to today. But looking back on just like, you know, hundreds of years ago or whatever in tribes, the, the medicine person, the medicine man or woman, um, there's always kind of like this air of mystery. Like not everybody in the tribe was going to be the shaman or the shamana. So it was kind of like a special calling um, uh, that, you know, that an individual would receive or an individual individual was just born with uh, certain abilities, kind of like latent abilities. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, the, the, the tools, the tools that you learn. So inevitably in the beginning of the plant medicine path and the shamanic path, you have to learn how to heal yourself. Or you should, I will say. Um, you should be learning how to heal yourself. Really, the main focus in the beginning is just healing. And so as you're healing, you're understanding how these medicines work on you and all the, the different levels of your being that I already mentioned from the spiritual up and mental, emotional, and all those subtle bodies. And, you know, if you have a, a good teacher that can keep you in line, that's good. Um, but they can really only guide you because the bulk of the information, the bulk of the wisdom that you're going to acquire is going to come directly from the spirit world and also from inside your own self. Um, the parts of your subconscious mind and soul that you're born with, um, it's kind of locked away until you wake up spiritually and then you can begin to access that stuff. So you become more aware of what reality is and the forces that govern this plane of existence that we're in here on the planet and the galaxy and the universe and so on. Um, Yeah. (laughs) There's more to that question, but I I 
kind of forgetting got a, got off on a tangent. Yeah, I, I mean, I think just that idea of tools. Um, when, when you mention healing, because that's I think that's a word that that gets thrown out so much now. Mm. What is what does that mean for you? Like, what what does it mean to in, in that initiatory process of, of of healing oneself? Yeah. So my so this is good because there was something I wanted to mention about healing and how it ties into certain concepts um, that come from the East, like this concept of enlightenment and so forth, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, it, so my belief and understanding is, is if you're born here in the third dimension on this earth, you, you will be wounded and you will acquire trauma and sometimes Im- immediately from your birth. Um, so just being born here, um, we become traumatized. We can start with birth trauma. For most people, it happens in childhood and then on through our lives. So these, these traumas that, <clears throat> that we take on leave a, a, an energetic scar or residue on us. Um, it's not just something that's in the physical body or that's in the mind, which even in Western medicine is very little understood how the mind fully works. But yeah, we, we receive um, these these wounds and they leave scars energetically and the, the fascinating and the amazing and the beautiful thing about plant medicine is they're one of the only things on this planet that can actually go in and heal us on those levels um, I imagine you can also heal them through forms of psychopar- psychotherapy and holistic practices uh, meditation and stuff but um, it's a lot more difficult and for whatever reason, it seems like these, these plants have been divinely created um, to kind of magically go in there and seek out the parts in our being that we can't otherwise heal with other means. Certainly not by, by pharmaceutical means and things like that. You know, some people say that taking, you know, a good and effective plant medicine ceremony is like 10 years of good psychotherapy functional and beneficial psychotherapy in a cup but that's only half of it too because there's also the integration work and the processing work that needs to be done so it's like with plant medicine um, the plants show up but they're only responsible for 50 percent of your journey they'll get to the stuff that you can't otherwise get at but then the other 50 percent of the responsibility falls on the person and the patient because um you have to modify behaviors. You have to understand why, um, you know, you were sick in the first place or why those things happen. So then you can continue to, to change your behaviors and improve yourself such that they don't happen again. You can't just take the cup and then expect it all to be done for you, you know, like the magic pill. So there's give and take and there's a, um, there's a you know, a requirement on both sides. That, it's interesting because they... Uh, I, I often hear this concept of, and I'm sure this happens with every generation, but, you know, like this idea that, that things are worse now than they've ever been. Mm. And, you know, we have more trauma and more distractions. And and yet, you know, you mentioned this idea of, of, of like Eastern practices. I, I mean, in Buddhism or the Buddha was teaching these things 2000 years ago. Mm. He was teaching the same things, <laughs> yeah. you know, like saying that suffering is inherent to mm-hmm. to the human being. That that you know, that's I think the I forget what it's called, but there's like the the four law, the, the fourfold path, you know. And the yeah. first one is there is suffering, right? So it's this acknowledgement that that no human being is immune from that. Um, and then even you were mentioning like the, this this culture of of Chavin, which predated the Inca civilization, you know, thousands of years. Mm. And it, it seemed to be a fundamental part of their culture was this plant medicine. So obviously they were also suffering. They were, they were suffering the human, whatever we want to call it, conundrum, the, yeah. the, 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 what it means to be a human. And right. yet <clears throat> it seems like a lot of these cultures like Chavin, you know, as you said, they, they, they revered the, the, these kind of magical gifts that, that, however we want to think of it, God, you know, the universe mm. gave us. Yeah. <laughs> like they exist. 
you know, and it, for me, it's it's one of the funny things when when we think about like the the illegalization of these things. You know, this idea that whatever it is, you know, a government, uh, the United States, in this very tiny portion of human history, this this one little place in the earth says we know better than the universe that this plant is a mistake somehow and mm. humans shouldn't take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is so insane. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's kind of this idea of like reality. Like when we fight reality, we lose. Like these mm. plants, they exist. You know, nothing, you know, if we believe in that idea of God or, you know, reality, then everything has a place. Like right. everything exists for, for a reason. It's not you know, random in a way. And I think it's fascinating because, you know, also one of the interesting things as we do begin to, to kind of study the, the brain and, uh, you know, the inner workings of the human being is most of these plants contain these alkaloids or chemicals, however we want to think about them in a more reductionist way, mm. where inside of us there's there's a receptor that takes that. Right. You know, it's like a keyhole with, within us that's like waiting for the key to go in yep. and turn it on. <laughs> yeah. So even within us, it's not like random. It's like those things are there. They're, yeah. they're waiting. You know, why, why would we have a keyhole in us if there's not meant to be a key put in it? Right. So why is kind of a, maybe a long way of getting to why do you think these cultures like Chavin, you know, had such a reverence for these plants? And we find it all over the world, you know, and I think maybe the more we begin to study these things, however we want to think about, you know, maybe why it's not as prevalent as it used to be, whether that's yeah. through suppression or a, a forgetting or uh, that's probably a whole nother topic. But it seems like all over the world, these cultures had a deep reverence for, for, for these plants. They were considered a, a gift, a teacher, mm -hmm. a, you know, something of the, of the highest order. It yeah. wasn't something that was taken lightly. I mean, right. if, you know, you mentioned Chavin, like they, they built this whole complex that was dedicated to this thing. And I mean, even that complex is like kind of in a way, the last thing standing, yeah. you know, of that culture. So it was, you could almost view that as like the center of their culture in yeah. a way. So why, why do you think that was, that was so important for, for these cultures? Okay, so I can answer that. But I first want to talk about, well, this is part of the answer, um, the human beings and the potentials that we all have of human beings, right, as human beings. People who are seeking this enlightenment state, it's my understanding that that enlightenment state is really just the healed state. And it's the, the wounding, the energetic wounds that we receive um, in our lifetime and maybe even potentially in past lifetimes that we carry into this lifetime that, pre that prevents people from full self-realization. Otherwise, when you're in the healed state, then that's it. That's that ascended state or that enlightened state as is. Um, and I believe that uh, over the, the, the history of humanity, there's been cycles, these great cycles of falling asleep and waking up and falling asleep and waking up. And it has to do basically with the movement um, of our solar system with respect to the galactic center. So you, it's roughly a 26,000 year period and you can look this up, they talk about it in uh, like Vedic traditions and so forth. But um, the period of time when our solar system is moving away from the galactic center, so roughly a 13,000 year period, is when we see a drop in consciousness and where we see a rise in ego and materialism. And then when the, this whole solar system, because our sun is moving around, um, we don't just revolve around the sun. So as we're moving back towards the galactic center, that's when we see a rise in consciousness and a, and a drop in ego and materialism. And this has happened many times in the past in the history of a of humanity and they talk about these like great cycles or these these world ages that like then rise up and then come to an end and in cataclysms and so forth and then like the world kind of regenerates and then new civilization rises up so <laughs> dependent upon where we are in time in this cycle um by and large it's going to illustrate uh you know the, the collective level of consciousness of humanity 
But that doesn't mean that as a potential, the spiritual nature of, of humans isn't that high ascended or enlightened state. So Chavin culture, 3,000 years old, we're in a pretty dark age then, um, a pretty dark period. So I believe that the, these cultures knew the importance of these plant medicines as a tool to heal and to awaken and to raise consciousness to get to those higher levels that really are just kind of our our actual nature, you know, whatever plane of consciousness or existence that we come from, it's a higher vibration than here. And we come here, you know, the reason that I believe that we're here, all of us, is to experience duality consciousness, which is like, you know, the light and the dark, the opposites, um, the good and the bad, good and evil, um, you know, things like that, um, these polarities. Um, because where we come from is we don't have any of that. We don't have these like perceived opposites of light and perfection and stuff like that. So we come here to experience it. And these plants are really the tools that dependent upon where we are in the cycle, where, where our, our solar system is physically located in the, in the galaxy. If the energy and the vibration is lower, uh, these are tools that can help people realize their divine natures and, uh, raise their consciousness. Mm hmm When you you were mentioning kind of this this idea that and again it's a really common theme in in this kind of shamanic path of, of this idea that, that certain people maybe have an innate gift. Mm. Uh, another really common archetype is is people come through some really deep suffering, some you know really deeply ingrained childhood trauma where they're deeply unhappy and, mm. and they're almost, it, it's like the suffering is so great. They're forced to, to either find a way out or to die. Yeah. Um, some people, there just seems to be some innate calling to, you know, I don't know what else to do. This is the only thing that makes sense yeah. to me. Um, so, you know, with that, I think that, you know, there's also, there's a lot of people who would say like, I'm good. I'm fine. Like, yeah, maybe, I, you know, some little things have happened to me, but I've dealt with it. Like, mm -hmm. why, why would I need to take plant medicine? Like, I'm, I'm good. I'm happy. I have a nice family. I have a car. I have a good job. Yeah. Things seem pretty good. Um, yeah. I don't think I need anything else. Yeah. Well, it really depends on the individual. I, I can't fully speak to that <clears throat> for those people, but there seems to be that, you know, Perhaps before we're born, or definitely before we're born, uh, we choose to have certain experiences in the lifetime. And, uh, and maybe for some people, their path in this lifetime is not to, um, is to awaken. And I think that's okay. I think that's probably the majority of the people, you know, in this day and age, at this moment, and time is not meant to be spiritually awake. That's okay. And, I mean, they, again, they talk about that in... Um, a lot of the texts and so forth that comes from the East. Um, so that doesn't mean that they couldn't derive some benefit from it if they felt called to it. But really it's just kind of like knowing that ultimately the people that want to, on a deep soul level, wake up will do so. And those who don't or have chosen beforehand not to just simply won't. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. because really like everything is perfect like I, I had heard this years ago um, that only perfection exists you know um, we, we can look at the world and say like these things are imperfect but really they're designed to be that way so there is a perfection that like precedes that like in this plane of consciousness again this 3D duality consciousness like we can perceive things as being um, imperfect but they're designed to be that way. And in that, there's an inherent perfection. Um, it's just like you were mentioning earlier about nature and the plants and like to think that, like for me, it's like preposterous to think that things could be growing here that could exist here that are not like perfectly and divinely designed. Like these plant medicines, they fit perfectly, the keyholes that you mentioned. You know, and then there's this like duality mind, this like ego mind of man, like you can take the coca leaf, for example. It's medicine. 
It grows. It was per- perfectly designed by some sort of higher power, right? But then man has to go and try to like process it and extract one alkaloid and like make an 800 to one concentration just to get cocaine. And now it's no longer medicine. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes something like 800 kilos of leaves to make one kilo of powder or something, 800 to one. But the, but the balance of the alkaloids and everything in the leaf is perfect as it exists. It's the same with sugarcane, for example. Sugarcane is medicinal, but when you extract the sucrose, you take out all the other balancing alkaloids and all the, the magic, and then it's, it's not healthy anymore. Mm-hmm. So, It's an interesting thing because it's, it's something I see uh, with the climate kind of debate a lot is this idea that we're moving, uh, like the world is out of balance and kind of as if, as you were saying, you know, from a higher point of view, that's impossible (laughs) because everything, there can't not be balance, you know, it's like a scale, Mm. you know, we say it's balanced when it's perfectly level, but this also isn't an imbalance. It's just, it's a different balance. You know, this is heavier, this is lighter, but there's still a balance. It's balanced perfectly from a gravitational point, you know, and so obviously, you know, everything we do has an effect there's, we can tip the balance potentially out of favor for humans, but we're tipping it in favor of something else, fire, destruction, you know, (laughs) whatever life form will thrive in that environment. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, so when, when you were describing, uh, you know, beginning to commune with the, the, the spirit, you, you, again, you referred to him as a he with Wachuma, you know, potentially with some people that resonates, they, they understand that. For a lot of people, that seems like a very foreign idea. So uh, kind of for you, what does that mean when, when you say, like, you know, the, the spirit of Wachuma mm. or the spirit of ayahuasca? Yeah. Well, it's just a knowing that... <clears throat> that the plant is a sentient being. And on a certain level, it has, uh, you know, cognitive uh, faculties that you become aware of when you, you know, when you ingest the plant and uh, there's something in the medicine that's the key for those keyholes in your brain and your body that you can then communicate with the consciousness of the plant. And so for most people, it, it comes through in kind of like telepathic communication. So, you know, you're, you're sitting there and then you hear a voice that's communicating with you, that's speaking to you, which you can hear and then in your own kind of mind's eye, reply back. So that's one of the ways that um, you can communicate with the plant world or the plant medicines that you, uh, you know, have ingested, what you and ayahuasca and others. Um, and sometimes you'll actually see... Uh, the figure of the plant spirit that, um, you know, that you're working with uh, in your vision. So with your eyes closed, it's kind of coming through the third eye, as they say. And however the plant wants to present itself to you, and some of them have kind of a, a form that, that many people confirm that they've seen. And that's one way. Sometimes and you'll see that the plant spirit also in the environment around you. Because, like... It kind of touches into, like, as above, so below, as within, so without. Like, the walls between everything is really only, like, perceived. Ultimately, at a very higher level, everything is connected. There is no inner or outer. It's all one thing. So, (laughs) you know, when you work with these plant medicines, you become more aware of that. But as it pertains to human beings and as is useful for us, you know, we have separation. Like this is the chair, this is my arm, and, and so forth. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how you can really communicate with them. Mm. So how would, you, how would you describe Wachuma? I mean, I think more and more, like many of these plants, they're, they're becoming more well-known. But certainly ayahuasca is for sure, it's, it's, it's gotten out there much more. It's kind of, in that kind of quality of a vine, it's really kind yeah. of spread it, itself out. You know, some people have maybe heard of Wachuma, some people haven't. It can also be called San Pedro. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how would you how would you describe that? If someone has never heard of that, mm-hmm. they have no idea what it is. How, how would you how would you describe that to them? Yeah. So the Wachuma medicine it comes from a cactus that grows all throughout the Andes. Uh, it's the fastest growing cactus in the world, um, and yeah, I mean ultimately, like I. I People should know that these plant medicines, these power plant medicines, or these uh, plant teacher medicines, there's a number of, of terms for them. Uh, master plants, you'll hear that a lot, the master plants. They can and will accomplish the same things for you if they're conducted properly and they're conducted effectively. Um, again, so it has to do with healing on all the levels of the being that I mentioned um, it will develop your consciousness if you're willing to take on the healing. And so the healing affects the consciousness development. So one affects the other. And then the consciousness development then involves your spirit. So those are like the three things I always talk about. Healing, consciousness development, and spiritual evolution. These plants are tools for those three things. And one will influence the other. You know, if people take it on, um, you know, in a humble fashion and are dedicated to doing the work. So I don't ever separate consciousness development and spiritual evolution from plant medicine healing. I don't feel that it should be conducted that way. Um, that way we won't see that disconnect between, you know, taking plant medicine and becoming this advanced uh, shaman, but yet the rest of your life is a mess. So that's a disconnect. So it's more of a holistic approach. And uh, Wachuma, along, you know, similar to ayahuasca, can accomplish this. For people who don't know about it, um, well, there's not that much out there about it compared to ayahuasca on the internet, in books, on podcasts, um, and so forth. I have some reasons and I have some beliefs about why. I think there's also been a disconnect in the sense that um, a lot of the wisdom about how to conduct the medicine has been lost in the centuries and, and millennia since maybe the height of the Chavin civilization. There are ways to prepare this medicine that can give people the effect and uh, the potency that they're experiencing with ayahuasca shamanism. And for whatever reason, I have been gifted and blessed with uh, the ability to make that medicine. But that also requires me to be doing shamanic work within the healing circle. You'll hear a lot of hear or see or have experience for some of you out there. Um, Wachuma ceremonies uh, being conducted in certain ways, uh, which I don't agree with. Um, That with lesser preparations of the medicine or um, ceremonies that are not fully shamanically conducted or facilitated Um, now i'm not saying that they shouldn't exist they just do but i feel like with respect to doing your healing and if you're on a consciousness path that you should really be able to maximize the benefits that you can get from any particular plant that you're working with or any tool or practice that you take on so my role and uh, my job my responsibility is to deliver that for people with the Wachuma medicine. So that includes um, conducting a fully shamanically um, facilitated ceremony and healing circle. So we're not talking about going for a walk or hike. Um, Yeah, we're talking about a full on, uh, you know, medicine circle and healing circle and ceremony so that people can really let go and let the medicine um, help them and heal them and not have to worry about other logistics like walking and the safety of like being out in nature on hikes and things like that. Like everything is held for you in the space. And I really feel that that will maximize the benefits that everybody can get from taking the medicine. And so I'm always endeavoring to do my best. So for me, this is the best that I know. Um, And I feel that, you know, it's comparable to the best uh, healing that you can get from ayahuasca out there. And so that's just one of the things that I like. hope people can take away from this and understand that I'm here um, as an ambassador of, of Wachuma. You know, it's my life path. And um, for those of you who have listened to this, this uh, talk up to this point and understanding a bit of my background and how I've got to be at the level that I'm at, 
Um, is it the highest level that anybody can get to? No, probably not. I'm still always constantly working on myself, but I know that I've put in the time, um, you know, so far to get to this point so that I can be the medicine for everyone. I mentioned it earlier. Um, we really need to be and embody the medicine for people. So, you know, I'm hoping that that more people out there can know that there is this other medicine that they can get to know, that they can meet, they can kind of meet and uh, interact with the spirit of this plant and uh, kind of understand its personality, so to speak, because all the, all the plant spirits have their own kind of personality that's different. Wachuma's personality is, is different than ayahuasca, but they seem to be in cahoots, those two. They work together. Some people like to work with both, or some people may feel more called to one or the other, and that's totally okay. But I think in, in, today's, in today's world, um, you know, people are really turning constantly to the Internet for information about plant medicine. And just like with the proliferation of information about ayahuasca out there, um, people aren't necessarily, necessarily aware that there's an alternative. And I'm not saying that it's like... You know that oh, wachuma is better than ayahuasca. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about um, a different plant that can accomplish the same things. And you know, with the way that I conduct things, the way that I've been guided by spirit all these years to do things, can do it at the same level of effectiveness than ayahuasca, which I don't think you're necessarily experiencing out there with a lot of the wachuma practice. So I want people to know that and. Um, Maybe some people are really wanting to awaken spiritually, begin their spiritual path to heal, and they might feel that ayahuasca isn't right for them. Well, then they know that there's an alternative that can do the same things. Or some people just may feel more of a direct call to the cactus medicine. That's great too. Or some people may wish to experience both or have already worked with ayahuasca and want to try something um, different. One of the things that I... Um, sometimes see <clears throat> with plant medicine is people who work with the same plants over and over again. Um, sometimes there's little like cracks and things in there that that medicine hasn't gotten to. And taking a break from that and going working with another plant medicine can like get in there. I don't I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like things that if you've if you've done ayahuasca for five years, right? You know, you've you've achieved a, a certain amount of healing, but there may be some things that you're just unable to get with that. Then coming and say and like doing wachuma, um, we'll get into those cracks for whatever reason. Um, so that's something neat too. So you can use it to kind of like supplement um, your your healing path with another uh, plant medicine as well. Obviously, everyone's experience working with any plan is, is going to be very, very different and, and very unique. But there do seem to be, you know, somewhat common archetypes. I mean, even in the way in which an ayahuasca ceremony is held, mm -hmm. often at night, you know, drinking a cup, there's someone singing to you. How would you describe the, the actual ceremonial process of working with Wachuma and and then also, are there, for you, similarities between maybe that archetypical ayahuasca mm -hmm. experience? Are there differences? What are those differences? And also in the way that the plant works, because you mentioned, you know, each of these plants is a complete system in and of itself, but they have, they're different. Right. You know, yeah. one's a cactus, one's a combination of two other plants. So just fundamentally, they're different. So obviously they, they would work in different ways. So... Uh, you know, if someone is maybe familiar with with ayahuasca, or even if they're not, maybe you can describe a little bit about mm -hmm. that. But but then also with wachuma, like what are the what are the differences? What what separates it? What's the the quality? Because yeah. I think that, you know, also as you said, there, there is so much knowledge seemingly now on the internet, but it's not always necessarily knowledge that's based in wisdom or right. you know a, a, a real deep understanding of of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> basically, the way that the the journey itself, the way when you ingest the medicine and how you experience it between those two plants is different. So um, I conduct the, the Wachuma during the daytime, and that seems to be the case for, for most uh, Wachuma ceremonies. So we start in the morning, and the effects of the medicine are going to last longer. Um, than ayahuasca. So we're talking about 12 to 15 hours average in most cases. But in my ceremony, <clears throat> I start in the morning 
And uh, the circle portion of the ceremony, I like to call it, lasts about eight hours. So that's when the effects are the strongest. Um, I sing uh, medicine songs in the ceremony for the first three to five hours, depending. Um, so the, the, the songs themselves are extremely powerful. So you have the power of the voice, the vibration behind it, which is healing. And also these songs uh, do or serve as specific functions in the ceremony. So calling in helpful spirits, um, driving the flow of the medicine, raising it up, lowering it down, um, clearing out certain energies, calling in certain energies. There's a number of things that these songs uh, do in the ceremony space um, that are really important that, that uh, complement <clears throat> what the medicine is doing within each individual. Um, Wachuma, it tends to be uh, it comes and goes in waves. Um, so there's a number of waves where it can get stronger and the effect is stronger and then it comes back down and kind of coming and going in waves for the, the course of the journey. Um, so like in my ceremony, after the singing portion and towards the end of the singing portion, I like to work on everybody individually. So they, they get an individual medicine song or ikaro. Um, and then a tobacco clearing and blessing. And then after that, we move into the more silent part of the ceremony where, um, yeah, people can have a little bit of light chit chat and check in with, with each other respectfully. Um, yeah, and then kind of riding out the last ways until the sun goes down. And then we make a bonfire and get served uh, tea and snacks and then have a soup dinner. And then everyone is just kind of still in the space, but kind of coming down until they're ready to go to bed so they can hang out around the fire as long as they want. Um, so it's a full healing day. It's a, it's a full day's event. Um, and everything kind of contained in the ceremony area and everyone is being looked out for. Um, with respect to how the plant medicines like heal and remove heavy energy. So like the shamanic understanding of illness is that um, we have we can acquire these energetic roots that are going to appear on one of the different levels of our being. So... Again, the subtle energetic, like the spiritual body, emotional, mental, and so forth. And these plant medicines and wachuma will go in there and uh, kind of like a heat-seeking missile and find them and remove them. And one of the major ways that these heavy energies are going to be removed from us is through the physical purge and the vomiting. Um, it's one of the ways that the body can get a large amount of these energies out. So it's not a side effect of the medicine like it's undesirable. It's one of the effects and one of the desirable effects. And uh, for most people in my experience with my ceremonies, uh, most people will purge. I conduct 10-day healing retreats that include three Wachuma ceremonies because it seems to be that three is the number that completes a treatment. That's like one particular work, not just one ceremony, but three. So most people will purge at least during um, one of those three ceremonies. And if they don't, that doesn't mean that the medicine's not working either. It will come out in other ways, um, through urination, um, sweating, or just the energy itself will slowly but surely come out through the aura and out. Um, with the medicine that I prepare and serve, people's experience in the ceremony uh, are usually three things or a combination of. Some people have fully inward journey, like lie down on their mat, close their eyes, full visions, and journeying inward like ayahuasca. Um, some people, or most people, will experience uh, altered states of uh, perception with their eyes open. So seeing energies in the environment, uh, sometimes seeing spirit, um, and communicating with the spirits of nature is very common, having a conversation with the mountain spirits or the plant spirits around you, and also with Wachuma himself. And then for most people, it's usually a combination of the inward and the outward journey. So with the eyes closed, going inward, and then with the eyes open and experiencing everything around them. Um, Wachuma seems to be a very direct spirit with respect to the the wisdom that it, and the information that it gives you. Um, and he doesn't always kind of like force you to go into areas that you don't want to go. Sometimes it seems like ayahuasca can be more like the, they call her the grandmother, the grandmother that grabs you by the ears, like, come here, you, and you have to go in and face this whatever, and you don't have a choice. It's like you've just like been put on the roller coaster and you're, <laughs> you're white-knuckling it. 
where um, with Swachuma, sometimes you kind of give are given an option, and it's like, well, you see this from your past, we need to go there, are you ready to go there? Not yet, okay, I'll come back. Um, sometimes that can happen. Or when the medicine is really intense, there seems to be a certain groundedness um, because we're outside in nature, we're on the earth, um, we're surrounded by these powerful mountains, which are really powerful, you know, energetic uh, structures and beings. Um, there seems to be a certain like supportedness where you can be like, all right, this is tough, this is intense, I'm facing things from my past or traumas and things that I don't want to deal with, but I know I have to. And there's a certain supportedness that you get in those Wachuma ceremonies with that, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah. You mentioned this idea <clears throat> that, uh, you know, potentially like the, the tradition of working with, with Wachuma was, was maybe broken at some point. Yeah. Do you have a sense of, of why that was or how that happened? And, and, you know, are there people who've still kind of carried that on in, in certain ways? And, and how does that, how yeah. does that, how do they embody that or, or manifest that? Yeah, my understanding of this actually is that the more unbroken lineages um, are more in like the north coast area of Peru. But at the time of the conquest, at the time of the conquest, the way... Um, ceremonies began to be conducted is uh, it changed. And maybe it changed even before that because there was a rise and fall of Chavin culture and other cultures throughout the Andes too, so we can't really, we don't really know. But it seems to be that at the time of the conquest uh, <clears throat> and then thereafter, the way that Wachuma was conducted changed. Now you'll see these Wachumeros in the north uh, coast regions of of Peru that have these elaborate mesas or these altars that have a lot of artifacts on them, and many of which are, are Catholic um, Christian artifacts. And uh, I think they began to to conduct the medicine at night. And it seems to be... Actually, there's a really fascinating documentary. Um, I forget what it's called, but it documents this man called the Tuna, and he is from the north coast of Peru. He was a... A Wachumero and documentary comes from the 70s and it was actually the same guys that did a pumping iron documentary which was the mm. the documentary about Arnold Schwarzenegger and the 1975 Mr. Olympia but the same guys mm. and so they they're they're following this man the tuna so the way he was conducting Wachuma ceremony is the medicine is gen generally weaker and so the person goes to the Wachumero goes to see the tuna I have a problem um, I lost my job my car got stolen, things are, you know, out of whack. Can you can you help me? So um, the patient does take a little bit of the medicine, but the Wachumero takes most of it and is doing most of the work on behalf of the of the patient, of the client, um, which is not my my approach to it. Um, my approach is more for the people to have a direct connection and powerful, life-changing connection with the plant spirit and the medicine and with divinity and, and creation. And my role is to hold the space and to guide them and to do everything in the space that maximizes um, or to optimize the ability for those people to have these life-changing experiences. And the work that gets done, they must do. You know, they have to face themselves. They need to... Um, heal themselves they need to modify their behaviors i'm not going to uh you know do anything do that for them we can't walk in someone else's shoes like everybody has to walk their own path like a friend of mine and a former client had mentioned uh, something years ago and i like this i like this saying it says that you have to do the work by yourself but not alone so mm. we're in it together but in a support role. So my role is a support role and as a guide and a teacher, but I'm not going to do the work for people. So yeah. And like, again, I've just been guided to do it this way. Like I had that experience that first time with Wachuma where I was, you know, I got the call and I was offered to take on this path. And so from there, the guidance to make the medicine the way that I do, um, to use the songs the way that I do and, and everything else. And just to really help people, to maximize their healing so that they can raise their consciousness and evolve their spirits. 
I heard you mention this idea, which I think is really good, that, that this work is like three circles. There's the, the, the guide, the person running the ceremony, there's the medicine, yep. and there's the participant. And like where those three cross, that's where the essence is. And, but you know, each of those has to interact with the other. It can't just be one or right. it can't even really be two. Like they all three have to come together. Can you, yep. can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So this, uh, this was explained to me actually, like, a number of years more into my journey, but I really liked it. And I, it was like, it clicked because it was like, oh, this is how I'm, I'm doing things. So somebody just explained it and showed the diagram. So we have these three circles, right? And each of the circles represents three integral components of the, the healing ceremony. So one is the, the patient, um, okay? And then the other is the, the plant, and then the, the third circle is the practitioner or the shaman, the medicine person. And so, you know, people can uh, think about those, these circle diagrams where they overlap. And um, where all three of the circles overlap is where the benefits are going to be the greatest. Um, taking into consideration or provided that each of the components is giving 100%. They're giving their best effort. So in the case of the patient, that means that they're dedicated to their healing. And then they're open to receiving and learning and listening and following the rules of the ceremony and doing the personal work, um, especially after the journey, the integration and the, the process work that's needed. And then the plan always gives 100%, at least spiritually speaking, provided that it's been um, made in a made in a good way, with good intentions, uh, made properly, then the plan is always going to give its 100%. And then the shamanic practitioner um, is the third component who hopefully has done the work on themselves to heal themselves and to attain a certain level of, um, of mastery with the plant medicine um, that it, you know, at least have gotten their black belt, we'll say quote unquote, the shamanic black belt. And so they're given 100% because they wish to see, um, you know, uh, the best changes and then the best healing for their clients. So we have the overlap with the three circles. Um, this is especially important for people who are beginning uh, their journey with plant medicine and beginning their healing journey. Um, it's not recommended for people to drink medicine by themselves. Um, because you're taking away this entire um, powerful component. You're taking away one of the circles. And now it's just uh, the patient and the plant and a patient who's not trained or not very learned in this world yet. Um, so they're missing out. And there's also inherent you know, dangers that can happen with people if they're working with it by themselves. But again, somebody's always going to say, but yeah, but you know, I've been taking plant medicine for 10 years. Can I go out and, and do by myself? And the answer is, yeah, probably yes at that point. Um, you know, me as a, as a practitioner and other practitioner friends, we can drink medicine by ourselves. But then the practitioner and uh, the patient is one in that case, you know. But still sometimes it's good to work with other, with other, uh, other masters as well from time to time. So if I want to sit in an ayahuasca circle, I'm not going to take ayahuasca by myself. I'm going to sit with a trusted uh, a master, a professional, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think some of those uh, dangers are, and 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 also maybe some of the downsides? Um, because I think you know, for many people who who have gone really deeply into this work, I, I mean, obviously there, there's something that's called them. They've experienced a tremendous benefit, mm -hmm. um, but also you know you use this analogy which I find interesting because I also practice uh, martial arts and you know this idea of a black belt and mm -hmm. you know uh, like in a jujitsu sense uh, you know one can be a, a purple belt which is, is very high mm -hmm. like it, it's a good practitioner yeah but they're not a black belt you know so that means there's things that they still don't know. So obviously, if a purple belt is leading a ceremony, there's a lot they can teach, yeah. but there's things they don't know as yeah. well. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think like many people who I've interviewed, uh, you know, I, I think most <laughs> most good people in a way tend to be a bit off the radar. You know, it's, I, I think it's just kind of something inherent in mm. in the work. 
and yet now that I'm doing this podcast, it's interesting because like putting the videos up online and kind of just in a way, you know, putting myself out there a bit. But de facto, because of that, you know, uploading these videos and stuff, I'll, I'll often upload them to, to like these like ayahuasca groups and, mm. you know, things like that. And, <laughs> you know, so when I'm putting the video up, there, there's like the whole stream of like all the posts and comments yeah. and things. And, you know, sometimes I just shake my head like, is this really an ayahuasca group? Like, like you know these are people who are claiming to have some sort of knowledge and yet yeah. it, it seems like you know a white belt or you know maybe a blue belt trying mm. to preach something when it seems like there's so many things that that that, that are out of alignment or, yeah. or so do you you know you mentioned some of these dangers so maybe if you can expound upon those and you know do you think there there's also like anything, again, I think that martial arts analogy is such a good analogy, you know, like if someone starts either working with these plants at a white belt level or a blue belt level, or even because as you were saying, you know, it's the path of being a doctor and the path of becoming more whole, you know, however we want to look at that, mm. more more awake, more more open, more healed, like they're not in one sense they are separate in this path and yet at the essence they're they're, they're moving towards the same thing yeah. and so do you think there's also a danger of you know it seems sometimes these plants can also potentially like while they can heal maybe if it's not they're they're worked with properly they can also potentially you know feed some of these things like feeding the ego you know you, you'll often see in this work you know, the sense of like, I know, you mm -hmm. know, or I'm better than because I, I do this work, you yeah. know, or, or this very common phrase that that's often thrown out, like ayahuasca told me or right. Wachuma told me, therefore it's true because it's seemingly coming from this, this higher place. And yet, as you mentioned, you know, you can't remove the, the patient from that, you know, so it's not... It's not, we can't just say, well, I, ayahuasca told me this, therefore it's true. Because right. you can't remove that from, from the source that it's coming through. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe just like some of the, you mentioned this kind of darkness or downsides. Like, do you, do you see some of those things that, that, that are things that, you know, also, because I think it's important, like as this work gets out there, like what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things mm. to, to look after? Not only in practitioners, but also in oneself, yeah. you know, to, to see like, hey, you know, maybe I have been doing this work for five years or 10 years, but if I'm still holding on to, to some of these things, like what are, what are signs to, to begin to see yeah. like, Hey, maybe, maybe I do need to go to someone to work with them because there is still something I'm, I'm holding on to. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to touch on, I think most of the things that you said and, and just the last thing that you said is like, yeah, go see someone because there's something that I'm missing. Sometimes things just remain in our blind spot. So, you know, get a little help from your friends. Go see somebody. Doesn't mean you can't come back to your own practice, you know, whatever. But yeah, the dangers. I want to say, first of all, that at some level of awareness, and it's like maybe higher up, you know, because everything is perfect, you know, even the dangers and the quote-unquote bad things that can happen to us here can yield benefits in our lives and time. So knowing that if you've gone through any of the quote unquote bad things that I'm going to discuss that, you know, on some level you were meant to experience that. And when you overcome that and transcend that and heal that, there will be blessings and gifts that will come. That said, I think we can minimize a lot of suffering for people by, um, you know, kind of following a, a certain straight path and, and avoiding these, these so-called dangers. Um, so, you know, like in this plane, in this 3D plane of perceived opposites, light and dark, good and bad, and so forth, um, you know, with plant medicine, there's a lot <clears throat> that, that most people don't realize exists, the so-called dark side or the dark side of the force. Um, you know, it was shown to me years ago that the power, the shamanic power, which is just energy, uh, can be looked at like a coin. It has two sides. One side is light, one is dark, but the energy is the same. Um, these medicines can be used to heal or they can also be used to harm, um, energetically speaking and spiritually speaking. Um, so 
What's the difference? It's the intention, the intention behind uh, the practitioner. So unfortunately, um, a lot of people get duped because there are people out there that kind of work both sides of the force. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to know going in if the people are pure of heart and have the best intentions for their clients and their patients. So you can get into trouble in that way. And that's not drinking by yourself. That's going and working with somebody that doesn't have your highest good in mind. But working uh, with the plants in the beginning by yourself without any kind of previous healing um, <clears throat> or, or protections that are given that come from the plants or that come from the qualified maestro when you take the plants, you're given protections. Um, when you take these plants in the beginning, it opens you up energetically. It blasts your channels way open. Um, <clears throat> your, your auric field um, is going to open up so that theoretically the energies that you want out you know, that are leading you to be in a state of dis-ease um, needs to come out. So that's why it's important to work in the beginning with someone that can hold the space for you so that you can let go and so that you can heal and all the shit comes out, <laughs> pardon the, my language, um, and you can do it safely because there are other entities out there, parasitic entities, energies, and spirits and things that can latch on to you when you're in a vulnerable state and then end up doing more harm to you. And that's really, hopefully, not the goal. You know, you're going into this to heal. You're going into this to uh, come out the other side lighter and better than you were before. So we want to be able to do that in a safe way and to be protected, not to pick up energetic gunk from the environment um, so that's like one of the dangers of working with these plants by yourself. And people might think that, you know, the Wachuma, that ayahuasca are like other types of psychedelics that are more synthetic or it's just a mind trip. You know, it's just chemicals in your brain that's producing this experience. And that's not 100% the case. Yeah, they're activating and working in your brain, but they are lifting the, the perceived veil of this reality which encompasses a lot more that we don't um, see or feel or perceive on a daily basis for most people. It's like, you know, the old uh, radio tuners. There's many stations, but we're always kind of dialed into just one, one frequency. When you work with the plants, then more of these frequencies become uh, visible and perceivable to you. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, it's important to be in a safe space and for it to be conducted. I mean, I, I, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, I don't like to waste my time either when it comes to, uh, to life. I like to streamline things as much as possible. So I want to get the, I mean, I want to have the best experience possible. So not waste my time. But then again, you know, um, my path in life has often been swervy and up and down. I've had some pretty horrible things happen to me, which, you know, after kind of transcending those things and overcoming them, I can see the gifts that have come. But I also recognize that in my role as a teacher, like I, on a soul level, chose to experience those things so that I can help other people that are going through similar things in their life. Again, so I can be the medicine, so I went through it. But now if I'm able to uh, to help people, you know, avoid some suffering. I'm willing to do that. So like, you know, I've made mistakes. I've learned from other people's mistakes as well. Kind of seen the good, the bad and the ugly in the medicine world. So now I can help people to, to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Another thing you mentioned that I want to touch on is about like exacerbation of the ego. 100% happens and you see it everywhere. Um, it also, why does that happen? Well, I don't know the inner workings of it, right? Nobody exactly knows. But it seems to be that people who work with plant medicines but are not really and genuinely taking on the challenge to heal all their stuff and to change themselves and become better persons and to like eliminate um, what we would call ego and the way that it manifests in their behaviors in life, if they're not willing to do that, it will absolutely and does exacerbate their egos and this is dangerous it's a big pitfall because it's like people keep taking medicine keep taking medicine and they think that they're graduating like in levels or in grades and it's not the case it's like 
each grade seems like it's infinite. They're just kind of spinning out in the same grade and their ego is just getting like inflated because they're, they're missing something or they're, they're unwilling to look at, address and heal their core issues. And so we see that. And I think that's probably, you know, kind of the case too with those native practitioners that we mentioned that, um, have kind of like compartmentalized, like this is my personal life. I can drink alcohol. I can, I cheat on my spouse or whatever, but in ceremony, I'm the man. Um, so there is some sort of like inflation of, uh, of the ego there. Now, now those practitioners too are coming from the culture and they've done, I'm certain, a lot of work too with the dieting and all that stuff to get to that level. But especially for like people who are not initiates or Westerners or whatever, there's a huge pitfall with taking medicine and not actually doing the work. Um, so you know, I would like people out there to to uh, to be careful of that because you will just spin out and you're you're not actually advancing. Do you think that's part of because in, in this work, uh, this idea of integration gets mentioned a lot, and it, it seems that these plants have this this amazing ability to teach, and and to teach from from something that is very pure, mm. something that's that's kind of. Uh, I don't know what the the right word is, but I don't necessarily like the word above. But but somehow, from a place that's that's deeper than uh, you know our as you mentioned the the, the frequency that our ego is operating on a day to day basis, um, and that's very profound. And and kind of that idea of like gnosis, it's something that that's like known deep inside of us. But it seems like that. You know, as you said, the, the, exactly this idea of like compartmentalizing and like we can have an experience, we can see a truth, which is also something like we seem to not like to talk about these days, you know, like there is no truth, mm. like, which is a statement of truth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that these plants have the ability to point us towards these truths, towards these timeless principles, towards these things that all of these cultures, all of these spiritual traditions have been pointing towards. And yet we can understand that in the experience or even, you know, outside the experience, compartmentalizing that. But it seems it can be very difficult. And and maybe that's where, uh, I don't know how you feel, that this process of integration comes in is much like you said, like, am I able to then take that principle and apply it to all areas of my life? Mm. Um. You know, an example I, I often use, it's not so relevant anymore, but it was one of the most fascinating things I would see, especially from, from people who had worked a lot with plants, you know, during the, the, the Trump era, is they hated the guy. Mm. <laughs> they hated him because they thought that he hated people. So they felt justified to hate him. And, you know, to me, that seems like a lack of principle. Mm. Like, if the principle I learned is, you know, this idea of, like, being compassionate with myself, understanding myself, like learning like why someone is suffering, like how can I hold that space to allow them to heal? And yet maybe we understand that. And yet then in some other aspect of our lives, we turn into the hater, the, yeah. the abuser, the, the person, you know, who, who, who judges, um, you know, again, the, like these timeless principles, like the, the golden rule or, uh, you know, as Jesus would say, like it, it, it's very easy to see the the speck in my brother's eye, but not the log in my own eye. Right. And so it seems like you know, again, one of these things is it's really even when these truths come through, as you said, it, it's like we can compartmentalize that in in a certain realm, but it's very difficult to then take that principle and apply it to all aspects of our lives yeah. <clears throat> outside of ceremony. Like, who am I outside of ceremony? Am I embodying the medicine? Mm -hmm. And, you know, many people, they would say they're doing that, and yet their actions seem to be pointing towards something very different. Right. So do you think that's part of, like, the, the integration? Or is that also part of, like, having a good teacher? Is, like, someone who can point that out and be like, hey, like, you know, this is where you're off, or... You know, someone who maybe your ego does begin to get really fed and it's like, okay, we're going to give you a big dose today. Yeah. And, and then let's, you know, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's calm that ego down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts of that? It's kind of an abstract question. It's, it's, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, 
you know, it's like if if you as a person are lucky enough to have, well, maybe it's not luck, but if you, for whatever reason in your life path and purpose, um, come to a teacher that's going to keep you in check that way, great. You know, you're probably going to suffer less. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's like the, that whole, like, do as I say but not as I do mentality. It's kind of like what you're talking about there. Like, I hate that guy because he hates, mm-hmm. you know, or, or whatever. Um, you got to be it, <laughs> you know, or the people who are compartmentalizing are, you know, do as I say, but not as I do. I'll tell you what to do in ceremony, but don't follow, you know, my lead outside of ceremony. But getting back to that, there is no outside of ceremony. So really how you are in your life is how you are in ceremony on some level. Mm-hmm. Lack of integration work? Yeah, probably, potentially. Um, some people who are called to be healers might just have this, this innate ability to kind of keep themselves in check with respect to um, staying on the path, embodying it, the principles, not just like talking about these lofty principles, but then not actually um, doing those things or following those things. Um, but, you know, for the rest of the people, it would be good to like kind of like <laughs> get close to somebody who is embodying it, who's being the medicine. Because there seems to be that when people heal themselves, their vibration rises. And so that vibration kind of has a ripple out or, you know, extends out beyond. So like when you're sitting with someone, um, like right now, you and I are sitting here, our fields are interacting. So in a certain degree, I think there's even like a certain amount of um, information that gets exchanged subconsciously that we're not aware of and just like driving the flow of this conversation, the questions that you ask me and my responses and so forth. So we're, we're interacting that way. So like if you kind of like find a healer that's really resonating at a high frequency, just being around them, it's going to help to promote your healing and your growth and it's going to bring your your knowledge up is going to raise your consciousness just by being around them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really big on the integration work and the processing work. Like I consider myself a teacher and I think it's such an integral part of the medicine experience. It's why I really feel dedicated to, um, to doing these retreats for people because it's a full program. It's the full package. Like we're there for 10 days focusing on our betterment. Um, you know, people can interact with me one-on-one or, or in the group shares that we do where I can share wisdom um, about the things that they've experienced in ceremony and to help guide them. You know, it's not enough, in my opinion, just to take the cup, have the ceremony, and then, like, off you go. Like, no, I'm going to help people to integrate, to pull down, if you will, some of this higher-level information that they get and ground it into their existence so that it's useful you know, in their day-to-day lives. Um, and that's an ongoing thing, too, for, for those who, you know, want to take advantage of it. Um, you know, checking in with your facilitators and practitioners when you go back. If you, you know, did your retreat here in Peru, you go back to your countries. Um, just to kind of keep you in check. Um, just kind of stay on the path. Mm-hmm. I think that's very important. There's often this aspect, and, and you see it in, in a lot of shamanic paths, and it's this idea of suffering. I mean, very, very commonly, like they would say, like the path of the shaman is the path of suffering, and kind of this idea that the path of dying, it's that we, we, have, to, we have to go into our suffering to, mm-hmm. to emerge from it. We have to go into the darkness to be able to embody that light. And kind of that balance of, like you said, you know, in an ultimate sense, sometimes these very difficult experiences can be our greatest teacher. And do you think maybe some of that maybe pitfall too is is this this idea? Because you know, even even if one is practicing, I mean, anything. Like again, going back to the martial arts analogy, but you know, just because I become a black belt that's just the beginning of a whole nother journey. And so, you know, continuing to, to push ourselves and it, it seems like something these plant medicines are doing, as you said, is it's like lifting this veil and, you know, often that's very uncomfortable and that can really shake things up. Yeah. 
And so this idea of, 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 you know, I think so much of our lives, and it's this interesting balance, you know, like even in this house, I, I just got these tapestries and this rug. And why? Because it brings some comfort. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a, at least to me, it's aesthetically pleasing. But, you know, it's like these little things that, le- that make life more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's beautiful. That's essential. And yet also what a lot of these paths seem to be pointing towards is like there's times where we need to go out into nature on the mountain and spend five days which isn't going to be comfortable. Mm. Like there's no roof over our head. You know, these things that we really take for granted. I mean, it was one of the things like when I was in the jungle that I really understood that phrase, like to have a roof over your head mm-hmm. because the, 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 the roofs were made out of, you know, like a palm leaf and mm-hmm. sometimes they, they get holes in them, you know, an animal burrows and it's right over your bed. And at that moment you don't have a roof over your head. You're getting rained on, you know, and that's not comfortable. Yeah. And it, but this idea of, you know, it seems like a big part of this path is is going into the discomfort, like putting ourselves in situations that aren't comfortable, because it is in those moments where we do have to, in a sense, find that internal peace, that, that internal, okay, well, I'm, I'm very much out of my comfort zone now. And yet through that, which is not easy, you know, no, nobody wants to necessarily sign up for that unless... Right. There's kind of they know on a deeper level there there's there's something waiting for them on the other end of that, but again, it seems to be such a common theme of this idea of like discomfort, even the dieta you know it's this idea of isolation, no contact, maybe not eating for long periods of time no no stimulus it's mm-hmm. just you, and for most people that's extremely uncomfortable, and yet it's it's seen as an essential component mm-hmm. like this idea of putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions. And it, it seems like so much of the culture we're, we're coming from and living in is all about, like, how do I make my life more comfortable, more comfortable, more easy, so that I don't have to deal with that discomfort. Yeah. There's these, these kind of coping mechanisms mm-hmm. to cover those up. And yet it seems like the shamanic path is saying, like, that's great. And yet we need to continually, in some manner, whether that's once a year or you know, whatever it is for you, but to put yourself in that state of, of, of disease. Yeah. It seems to be that operating outside of your pure comfort zone is like where growth occurs. And I think that's, that's talked about a lot. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be, it's like, <clears throat> or to touch on something that you mentioned a little while ago, it's like if you want to remove yourself from pain, the only way out of the pain is through the pain. You know, we have to address it and dress it, uh, sit with it, experience it, observe it, whatever, feel it, talk to it, and then let it go. But the repression of pain to avoid pain, ironically or whatever, is going to perpetuate it. <laughs> so that's how, you know, it works with plant medicine healing and shamanic healing. Like you have to go in and re-experience things but you're re-experiencing them on the way out. You are acknowledging these things um, so that they can teach you and you can let go of them. And then after, you know, then you heal that stuff, that's when the blessings come that we were talking about. But yeah, just trying to keep everything real sterile and, and c- comfy and cozy is it's not really going to lead us to growth. Um, it's like people who are on these like epic life journeys of awakening and, you know seeking higher consciousness and so forth. It's usually precipitated by like some sort of crisis. It's the hero's journey. It's talked about, you know, it's uncomfortable, some sort of crisis. And especially amongst healers, like are going to have like life crisis or crises, plural, that when overcome, they're, they're blessed and gifted with the ability to heal, like to help others heal. Like I always, you know, I, I can call myself a healer, but I don't actually heal anybody in the sense that I serve as a catalyst um, and a guide for people to heal themselves. I can help and we help each other. We all help each other. We're not here alone. You know, we're doing the work (laughs) by ourselves, but not alone, hopefully. Right. But uh, yeah, everybody has the, the, the innate ability to heal. Like we don't have to tell our body and ourselves to do things. You don't have to 
tell your heart pump this blood you need to beat now and, and all these things there's just there seems to be some sort of like innate intelligence this divine intelligence in, in us um so we operate at the levels that we can manipulate you know um how best to apply our energy in the world around us to accomplish our goals and what we believe is our life purpose and then the rest we can kind of just leave it to spirit and we have help call on others when you need help um that's a big thing sometimes people are so afraid or or ashamed to ask for help but we have to do it ultimately if you want to um heal yourself if you want to heal yourself there is a period in time when you will have to surrender in a sense and ask for help from someone else and that person will assist you that might be coming to me for the retreat right and i'm going to conduct the ceremony for every for you and hold the space and make sure it's safe and make sure i made that medicine really nice for you and i <clears throat> and i'm pouring my heart into the into the circle and into the songs and everything and then you can start healing yourself but Ultimately, you know, it begins with asking for help, too. And that's tough. I mean, I've been there. Many of us have been there where we, we've just felt self-conscious or ashamed to ask for help. But it's all connected, right? You know, maybe don't look at it. You're asking this other stranger, this separate being or entity from you. Because on some level, we're all connected and we're all one. So you can ask. It's just an extension of yourself mm. <laughs> in a way. You mentioned this idea, like like with coca, that, that you know that this, this final substance of, of cocaine is very far removed from from the actual plant, yeah. and you know it takes a tremendous amount of leaves to produce that. You know, quite unsustainable. All the chemicals, the kerosene, the the, the pollution. Um, what are your thoughts on? It? Because it seems like. A lot of this work is, you know, it, like obviously a lot of people are coming down experiencing these plants like ayahuasca, wachuma, um, but also as that happens, there's a real resurgence in interest in, you know, the, the way that in, in some of the cultures we come from, the, this kind of like reductionist way of looking at things, which, you know, a lot of people look at is is like bad which i don't it's it, it, like everything as you said it serves a purpose there's a beauty to that mm. and, and there's a downside to it yeah. but this idea you know of of breaking these these things down you know like coca or, or wachuma or, for example and saying well this is mescaline that's what's giving the effect and yet not seeing all of the other alkaloids or all of the other chemicals in that plant not seeing the importance of the ceremony, of the patient, of the practitioner, the environment, the intention, you know, all of these other external factors. Um, and yet it seems like, you know, that's really one of the directions this work is moving. Things like psychedelic assisted therapy. I mean, they're becoming very, very common. Um, psilocybin, MDMA, uh, you know, to, to more of a degree now, also DMT. Um, I imagine mescaline is, is going to be one of those as well. And it, so what are your thoughts on those? Because on the one hand, you know, there is like this completely taking it out of context, all of the other things that are happening. And yet on the other hand, it seems like there's a tremendous benefit. Uh, I think it was MAPS who just did a uh, a whole uh, multi-year project with, uh, I believe it was MDMA and uh, PTSD, mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder. And they found that two-thirds of the people actually freed themselves of PTSD, which is incredible because yeah. there's nothing else in, in, in you know pharmaceutical medicine has come close to that. I mean, the best that could be done was like symptom reduction and having to take these 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 pills on a regular basis to try and just mitigate the symptoms but it was always there you know and it could flare mm -hmm. up and but you know two-thirds of the people were free like it was gone which is incredible yeah i mean i think it's also easy to say like well one third still you know has them but right. two out of three are free you know which is incredible in a way so do you have any sense of of like that balance of you know, on the one hand, there there does seem to be a real benefit, and yet on the other hand, there potentially could be all sorts of aspects that are missing as well. Yeah. You know what? <clears throat> it's an improvement, I would say, 
the very least, um, what you're, you know, those therapies that you're discussing are at least a step up from everything else that they were doing in mainstream medicine, allopathic medicine, or what's, you know, mainstream or accepted by society. <clears throat> it's a step up. So I think that's good, you know. Um, but there's other, obviously, more holistic approaches out there as what we were talking about, the complete package with the, with the, the plant medicine ceremonies. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, <clears throat> I wouldn't say I'm against it. It seems to be that maybe some of those uh, practices in the way of thinking is very linear, left-brained, so to speak, quote-unquote, um, logical. It's coming from like mm, science, scientific method and so forth, where there's really so much that happens with respect to like plant spirit medicine that can't be measured. You know, it just can't be measured by science. But the proof is in the pudding. So you do the work, you feel better, you feel healed. Then you know we don't need uh, scientific measurements to say that you're healed. There is a certain large amount of subjectivity in that. Like the two out of three people that released their PTSD, how do you prove that the PTSD is gone? How do you prove that it was there in the first place? Well, you took their word for it. I'm suffering. You know, you know they went through the traumas and then now they don't have the symptoms anymore. I, you know, <clears throat> that's good enough for me. <laughs> so, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. How do the people feel afterwards? But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's a step up. I don't have an issue with those, <clears throat> with those therapies, you know, conducted in a clinical setting with uh, psychedelics or <clears throat> entheogens. Um, but, uh, you know, it would be ideal, <clears throat> excuse me, that... Um, you know, plan medicine circles and, and, and conducted properly, uh, that those would become more mainstream and accepted, you know. <clears throat> and if they don't, then that's fine. They're here. They exist. And, you know, I'll get the word out there in any way that I can. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, of the direction these things are moving in? I mean, in the beginning... You mentioned this idea of these cycles of time and there, there are certain times that are potentially more auspicious. But certainly, I mean, it seems, and maybe it's just the advent of the internet, uh, maybe there's a really deep need, potentially the destruction of a lot of the climates and habitats in which these plants are, are, are native to. Um, but for whatever reason, it seems like there is a, a, a tremendous expansion of, of these plants. I mean, 20 years ago, if you ask someone, what is ayahuasca, that would be a word that would, just wouldn't resonate. Yeah. And, you know, now I would say a lot of people know what ayahuasca is. I mean, maybe they haven't experienced it, but they've yeah. heard the word. And, and certainly there's many people who have experienced it. And, I mean, even in kind of the, the, the legislation in a lot of these countries where at a time where it's like, okay, well, how do we deal with this? You know, it, it seems like it's a movement that's growing kind of exponentially. So do you have any sense of, of the direction this is moving in that, that uh, you know, like that this is something that's just going to continue to, to expand and will become part of people's lives uh, much in this way of like a hero's journey or mm -hmm. an initiatory experience that it's something that, that, you know, many people, it will just become part of their lives or you think there's roadblocks in the way of that or just any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's gaining momentum. <clears throat> But I think, like, one of the big things is, like, legalization, right? We talk about legalization, or we talk about decriminalization of uh, entheogenic plant medicines, of these substances as they're classified, you know, by governments. So there seems to be, like, two steps forward and one back. So they'll legalize them, but then the government wants to swoop in and, uh, and control it, um, or say how it's going to be done, or like with the legalization of cannabis. Um, so they legalize it, but then like big pharma is getting its its hands on it and wants to control it. So it's like 
we're moving in the right direction, but then there's like some steps back. So that's a concern of mine. Um, you know, I would love to see like plant medicine, you know, entheogenic plant medicine legal everywhere, but that doesn't mean that you should be going to the store and, <laughs> you know, buying a bottle of Wachuma and then just like knocking it back and off you go. It's like we're removing all the like necessary components of the healing ritual, you know, of the healing experience in that case. But yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> it would be ideal and be um, hoped for that these things could be decriminalized. But that's one of the beauties of, of here in Peru is that these traditional medicines are, are protected. They're revered and honored in a way and protected. Um, and it's also, it's not so terrible, like, that it's only here. Because in a certain sense, it takes a certain... It like makes the, the 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 individual who wants to get the healing be dedicated to their own healing and growth, because it's instead of like just like driving down to the, you know, to the grocery store. Oh, here we go. Uh, what do I want today? I ask uh, mushrooms. Yeah, what you do? Take this and off you go. You have to kind of, not kind of. You have to be a certain level of determined and dedicated to wanting to change to plan to do a retreat in a foreign country. So I think that's good because it, it, it like keeps people in check. Like, I really want this. I need this. It doesn't matter what it takes for me to, uh, to get it. Whereas I know that there's many circles now that are be, being <clears throat> held all over the world in other countries. And uh, I think the experience in, in a number of those cases can be diluted a bit. Like, people don't have to, like, really sacrifice too much to get the healing. Yeah, I can go do it on this weekend or I can go do it on that weekend. And they're not really, it's like a little bit more of a toe dip than taking the plunge. So there is, you know, positives to it only being fully accepted and legal in a place like Peru. Um, not to say that people shouldn't, you know, partake if they can have the opportunity to do so in other places. But if you really want to take the plunge, which I think is required to like to make any kind of significant change, you know, it's good that you have to come here mm -hmm. to Peru to do so. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I noticed uh, working at the, the Temple of the Way of Light, which is a big ayahuasca center, is the workshops are always sold out. So you can only book, you know, a few months in advance. Right. Um, and then, you know, th there's a deposit. It's like you're already intertwined mm -hmm. to the experience. You're, you're literally invested in it. Yep. Um, and then there's like all this, like there's this time of this like preparation, like, okay, I, I have to clear my calendar. I have to buy a plane ticket. I have to take off work. And then there's the, the physical preparation, which they begin to tell you, okay, like starting to cut out these foods, mm -hmm. uh, you know, certain lifestyle things. And you know, and then there's the whole journey, the going to Peru, going to Lima, probably having to spend a night, getting another plane, going to Iquitos, probably spending another night, like trying to find your way around completely, you know, from most people, very different circumstances. Then this bus picks you up and they take you to this river and you have to get in this boat and yeah. then you're walking through the jungle. And, you know, so it's, it is kind of in that way. It, it, it's like a big commitment and it's even almost like part of that hero's journey in a way. It's mm. like, you know, just the journey to get there, it, it can be very profound for people. Yeah. It's like, it's already starting to put them out of their comfort zone. Right. And that's cathartic in itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes you'd be amazed by like what, um, <laughs> uh, what little components that you don't think about, like, like you're talking about, uh, can be like, Massively cathartic for people. Mm -hmm. I have a good friend now, and she was originally my client. I and um, um, I also lead tours uh, with kind of like a spiritual focus. Um, but some years ago, I was leading a tour, and it was eight days. It included a watchman ceremony. We went around to the various sacred sites here in the in the Cusco region, and um, just just like something as simple as like going through this tunnel there's this this neat tunnel at the site of Sacsayhuaman which is up above Cusco it's a uh an ancient initiation center it's known for the huge megalithic stones um or the megalithic structures which means big stones <laughs> but um just going through this tunnel and and this particular individual had a really hard time because it was like claustrophobic it was scary and whatever and um 
you know, had a hard time. But fast forward to some months later, she writes this post on Facebook about how that was the, that was the huge moment of her, of her healing journey was like facing the fear and going through this tunnel, which is completely pitch black, you know, for about 37, 30 seconds or so as you're going through and saying how that that was like so special. It wasn't even uh, as much the Wachuma ceremony or later her ayahuasca retreat, but just like, you know, as we guided her through this, <laughs> this dark tunnel. So there's like so many components to going on the healing journey beyond just uh, simply being in the ceremony and, and taking the cup of medicine. So all these things that might get overlooked but can be really, you know, life-changing for, for people. Do you think that's part of actually like the, the, the magic or the, the, the catalyst of some of these medicines is it's like they, they have to bypass the, the mind or the conditions that, that have got us in the place that we are in? You know, almost this idea of like, like with this with this woman, if if she knew before that going through the tunnel was going to be her healing, she would have just gone through the tunnel, or right. you know, there would have been a path laid forward. And and so much of this medicine, I mean, it seems like such a common experience is, you know, people think they understand it or they know what's going to happen, and they're expecting, oh, you know, I'm going to see an angel or this thing's going to come out of me mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be happy. And almost always it never happens the way we think it's going to happen. Right. Do you think that's just part of the inherent way these plants work is like they have to bypass the mind that thinks that it knows or mm -hmm. it has to work in this, however we want to call it, realm of spirit or mystery or magic yeah. to actually be able to, to like bypass that, to get beyond that, to really, as you said, like penetrate like a... I forget what you use, like a fireball or something. And yeah, the heat-seeking missile. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so, actually. It's also one of the reasons, like, the mind can really be a, a block to accessing certain certain um, levels in the spiritual, spiritual dimension with the mind um, or the mind's hang-ups. So it's like I always tell people, all right, so <clears throat> you've decided you're going to do the plant medicine experience. You're going to have it. Um, you've watched some YouTube videos. You've read or listened and watched to people's testimonials. That's it. Don't do it anymore because the mind is a tricky little bugger, and it will latch on to um, the imagery that these people describe in their individual ceremonies. And I've seen people come down over the years. I also managed an ayahuasca camp for a year in addition to doing my own program with Wachuma. And like, especially in the early days, I was fascinated. People were like, yeah, but I saw this. And this guy said that he had this happen. And they were so fixated on, on that experience and they didn't have it that they missed all the other stuff that all the other blessings that was coming through for them. So yeah, like in a way, it's, it's good to have that part of the mind bypassed. I think we can oversaturate it. The mind, and or it's, it's tricky in that way. So I don't recommend people watching too many test, you know, too many testimonials. Once you've had enough to know that it's right for you, yeah, cool it, um, because what you experience in ceremony is going to be very unique and specific to you and tailored to you for what you need. Um, it's not going to be ever exactly as other people. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Do you have any sense of like uh, the direction things are moving in for you, like your work or, you know, like uh, where you see yourself and in the coming years and just kind of really grounded in this practice or any any ideas? Yeah, I mean, I see myself continuing to do the work and being available for people to do the work because it's like now more than ever, the world needs this. It needs awakening. Um, and people to to awaken and to heal themselves, which is going to raise the vibration on the planet. I mean, we think it's small, but it has a ripple effect. Um, you heal yourself, you interact with other people, you serve in, in certain ways as catalysts for them to do the same thing. Um, you know, I talked about the solar system making its return towards the galactic center. Well, that's happening. So people, more and more people, I believe and hope, 
will be coming to these medicines to awaken and to heal. <clears throat> and in that way, the vibration on the planet is going to rise, inevitably. It's kind of like we don't have to go to battle with the stuff that that's not working on the planet. Um, we just you know, focus on our individual selves, which helps the collective, you know, raise the vibration of the planet. We don't have to go to war against whatever, X, Y, Z. Um, so, yeah, I see myself here and uh, being in this role of service, um, you know, to raising the vibration of the planet one person at a time. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see um, as many people as feel called to it come here and take advantage of that. Um, you know, years ago, I was hesitant <clears throat> to um, to appear on in interviews and and on, on the internet and stuff. There, there was a certain resistance that I had to it, which I don't have anymore because I realized the importance of this work and I realized, you know, what I've got here that uh, must be shared with others. It's not just for me <laughs> by any means. So now I'm willing to, you know, to go on these interviews and to, to talk about um, the things that I've experienced and what I have to offer for people to put it out there because otherwise it's, it's unknown. And I think there seems to be a push <laughs> from the unseen realms, you know, the spirit guides, the plant spirits that are, you know, pushing me out there and not just me, but others too, who have a message, you know, of importance to share with the world uh, to get out there and make it known, hey, this is available, I'm here, I want to help, uh, my heart is open and I want to receive people and I want to help people. And it's part of, you know, it's my life path, it's my purpose, and I'm being guided to do that, but I also want to do it. So, you know, I'm taking on that responsibility of embodying the medicine and being the medicine. Um, so, yeah. I want to share that. You mentioned this idea, which I think is is really fundamentally important. Maybe you can talk a little bit about it. But this, you said this thing of, like, when I do the internal work, I don't have to go to war with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. It just feels to me like if you want to change the vibration of the planet, right, and you want to see no more haters in the world, well, don't hate the haters like we were talking about earlier. That's like one approach by which you're trying to remove um, something with force. Where instead, if you turn the focus on yourself and go inward and heal yourself and raise your vibration, eventually the vibration on the planet is going to rise such that it's unhospitable for hate. Yeah. Why do you think that's such a hard thing for people to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a, there's a lot of factors here. We are in this duality plane yet. Um, conditioning, I think, societal conditioning. We're social creatures. You know, we learn by uh, observation. You know, especially like in our formative years as as children. Um, they say like between the age of like like birth and age eight. Um, your entire like subconscious mind and programming is like uploaded. Um, and we learn that from like observing others. So our family and our peers and so forth. So there's a lot of like <laughs> energy credits, if you will, built up in like behaviors that are harmful or that are not harmonious. Um, so yeah, it takes some, some dedicated work to break that. Do yeah. you have any like advice or recommendation, you know, obviously outside of, uh, I mean, plant work is a huge catalyst for that, but anything that people can do outside of that to kind of in their lives cultivate that idea of, you know, going inwards rather than, than fighting these external wars? Yeah, I think it's just like, <clears throat> um, like mindfulness practices. You know, we, you know, we talk about that. Um, and, uh, I don't know. There's, there's so many tools out there that you can have in your spiritual toolbox, so to speak. If plant medicine isn't one of them, that doesn't mean it's not going to be in the future. So like I always talk about the spiritual t toolbox 
Um, and what that is, is it's a set of tools or practices that you use at any one time um, on your path. So if your intention is to raise your consciousness, evolve your spirit and heal, all right, so then you're going to carry tools in your, you know, your theoretical spiritual toolbox that are going to um, help you with that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging, it, depending on where people live to, and people living in some very stagnating and oppressive societies that are not like conducive to cultivating your consciousness um, just with the insidiousness of media and foods that are toxic and the list goes on um, so hey ask for help if you need it <laughs> as I mentioned before you know seek out the help that you need ultimately I you know I would like to see more people come to plant medicine so that they can have the awakenings and and have the level of uh, improvements that that they're seeking, but um, I think for people who are not there yet, they're not ready yet, or just for whatever reason they're they, they can't make it happen. Just just know that um, it's kind of like a message of hope. Like like know that healing is out there and it can be had. Um, so just keep the faith. I think that's really important. Just. Uh, have the faith even if things outwardly seem like they're collapsing or you can't get any ground or, or make any improvements, but just keep the faith. Mm. Well, great, man. Is there anything we're at 223, 23? <laughs> Interesting. But um, is there anything we didn't address that you'd like to, to, to talk about? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if if people you know resonate with you and they they like what you said and they're interested in working with Wachuma, how how can they get in touch with you? Yeah. So the best way right now is through my Facebook page, um, and it's called Wachuma Awaken, and that's spelled uh, W A C H U M A W A K E N, and you can find this page on uh, on Facebook, and the actual address is. Uh, Watch him awaken official. So I'm I'm working mainly with the Facebook page right now. I have a, a website for my tour company and medicine program that's kind of in the works. So for right now, the best way is, is through the Facebook page. Um, I also have the Watch Him Awaken YouTube channel now, um, so they can watch some uh, some videos. And I plan to be uploading more um, video type blogs and and things like that going forward. Yeah, great. And it can if if people are interested in working with you, they they contact you and they can come down for any amount of time. Are there specific dates or? Oh yeah, is it... yeah. So on the Facebook page, uh, I I have the retreats. I post the retreats. So I do individual ceremonies, and there's information about how that works. Like so, if you happen to be in the the Sacred Valley or the Cusco area, you know, I do offer single one off ceremonies, but uh, really. The, the, the medicine retreats, the 10-day retreats, are the ideal. They're the, um, the best opportunity for people to make like serious, trans serious and significant transformations in their life. So I offer those. Um, they're on the Facebook page listed as events, um, all the information. Um, so you can, uh, you can read about it, everything that it includes. Um, but like I said, yeah, they're 10 days. They include three Wachuma ceremonies. So we include other Andean, um, traditional Andean ceremonies like uh, despachos, um, plenty of time to rest and integrate, group circles. We take little day trips to, uh, to hot springs and things like that. So I really designed the program, again, to kind of like maximize the time and the benefits that you can get in the medicine experience. You know, you can kind of disconnect from the pressures of the world and really go inward and focus on the, on the healing. So I'm really, while I will offer uh, single ceremonies, I'm really promoting the retreats because they just, um, the ideal, they really maximize everything for everybody. Um, and I'm really proud of them and uh, feel honored to be in a position to help people make such significant changes in their life and to kind of stand there and act as a catalyst uh, for human beings' awakenings. Yeah. 
Well, great, Joey. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I think you, you have a great message to put out. And, um, you know, also I think uh, Wachuma, it's, uh, it's not something I've worked with a lot, but I've, I've really seen the, the benefit and the beauty in it. And, you know, I think all of these, as we would say, sacred plant medicines, master plants, it's their, their gifts. And, and I think, like you said, the, the, the more they can get out there, you know, in a beautiful way, in a way where that space is really being held and honored, I, I think they're gifts that, that hopefully... Uh, you know, anyone who feels called to work with can can have the opportunity to do that. And it, it has an amazing ability to transform people's lives. So I think it's amazing what you're doing and holding that space and doing that work. Uh, you know, the, the world needs more people like that. So thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge. And I, I hope, you know, some people My reach pleasure, out to Jason. you. My pleasure, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the message. And, you know, I hope to, uh, to be in a, a position of service for, for many of the listeners to your podcast. So yeah yeah well, great brother thank you yeah. so much thank you. yeah it's been a pleasure yeah. <laughs> all right everybody that is it i hope you enjoyed that conversation with joey uh i think he's got a really nice way of expressing himself and uh, a really good ambassador for this plant medicine of wachuma um so that's it uh if you're able to support the show patreon is a really good option uh, it's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, you can sign up, and it's a really beautiful way to, if you feel like you're gaining something from these podcasts, to help to support and to give back. And with that giving, there's also something in return, things like early access to shows, Q&As, bonus material. Uh, so that's a really big help, a really big support to all the people who have done that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, there's also the ability to donate directly via PayPal. Um, there'll be a link in the show notes for that. And then if you're not able to do that, uh, going on the YouTube page, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help with the video algorithms via YouTube and with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts and leaving a starred rating and a short review. That's a really big help. Um... My next guest is going to be my friend, Carrie. Uh, she's a psychotherapist. She recently completed the uh, MAPS uh, Psychedelic Assisted Therapy training. Um, so she'll be coming on and we'll be talking a bit about her background, her work with different plants and the, the therapeutic work she does. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate all the support. I hope you gain something from this episode and I will see you all on the next one.